It's a different salutation. This is a caucus of the Municipal Council of the City of Jersey City. It is Monday, July 17th. In the year 2017, we had a 10 a.m. start. I'm using my phone to one, silence it, and to determine the time of 10.15 a.m. So would everyone kindly silence their devices? Thank you. President, roll call at 10.15 a.m. Council Person Gajewski. Yeah. Gadsden? Here. Bajiano? Here. Yun? Here. Osborne? Here. Robinson? Here. Rivera? Here. Waterman? Here. Lavaro? Here. We have a full house. All nine members present. Council President, it is my yours. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for everyone who's in attendance today. Uh, we'll get started right away. And Councilman, the August meeting. Can we change it to 10 o'clock in the morning uh, instead of at night? Uh, I'll defer to the city clerk on that question. We would have to pass the resolution. We would have to enact that resolution. Could we do that at this meeting? If this meeting is or council meeting, or both? Caucus or council meeting, or both? Uh, I'm mainly concerned about the caucus meeting. Uh, but if we're going to change yes, one, we should be both. both. It should be both. I'll change both. Fine by me. Me too. Anybody have any complaints? No. I'm so fine. Can we change it? Change it. Okay. Change it. Can have, uh, at the request of Councilman Bogiano and um, other members of council, please uh, have a resolution prepared changing the uh, time for the August caucus and council meetings to uh, 10 a.m. Will do. Thank you. Here, uh, the other day they had the police promotion detectives made, and that one person on this council keep coming up. I know comes up to speak. You can bring that up. Okay. All right. So our first order of business is the uh, we have John Hallinan from the law department, along with uh, Jason Watson, who's uh, filling in in the first chair here um, for Jeremy. And uh, it's the project labor agreement ordinance, which is item uh, what's your name? 3G. 3G. Okay. Now I'm going to read the title into the record. 3G is an ordinance repealing chapter 304, taxation, article 7, construction, project labor agreements, and adopting a new version. John. A little typo. John, there. you want to say something about this ordinance and explain what the changes are here? So, uh, many of you may have been uh, made aware that on June June fifteenth, Judge Wigginton of the Federal District Court Judge, uh, she had struck down our PLA ordinance as it's currently written, and enjoined us from enforcing it moving forward. Uh, the basis of her decision, and this was part of an ongoing case called Allied Builders versus the City of Jersey City. Allied Builders, they are a trade organization that uh, basically pushes for free trade, free uh, enterprise opportunities for construction organizations as opposed to, uh, I, I guess you might say, sort of uh, the antithesis of the organized labor union effort to get union jobs on uh, projects such as the ones that are being built here in downtown Jersey City. And their argument was that the PLA, as it was written, uh, improperly interfered with the marketplace, that we were uh, a market regulator and not a participant. These were not city projects that we were imposing these PLAs on, and therefore they were improper. And the judge agreed. And the base of the decision is that if, it's a, if the city is acting as a market participant, meaning it's our project or we have a substantial stake in the project as a partner, then we can mandate who works in the project. If we are simply a project regulator, meaning that you know, we are issuing a tax abatement but we don't really have any financial stake in the project, then we really can't be telling any of these developers who they can hire and, and whatnot. So they, the court struck down our PLA. So what we attempted to do, and we're kind of in uncharted territory here, but we'll, we'll 
We'll try to do the best we can to amend the ordinance to be consistent with the district court's ruling. And moving forward, what we're trying to do is mandate PLAs only in those projects where the city would have a stake, a financial stake in the project. So we're not just giving out abatement because the court has ruled that an abatement is not a subsidy. An abatement is simply a forbearance of a tax in exchange for a tax down the road as an, as an incentive to get people to build. But it is not in and of itself a subsidy. It is not, does not constitute a financial stake in the project. So in any type of project where, and we've defined it here as uh, the issuance of redevelopment area financing, so that could be a redevelopment area bond, like for example what the KRE project got in Journal Square, or perhaps some sort of affordable housing grant, then we would be able to, if we provide those, then we would be not just a regulator, but we would be a participant. And then we can actually mandate that PLAs are required for the project. Now the court's not going to give us a advisory opinion on whether or not this ordinance is consistent with their ruling. We're doing the best we can to take the case law and modify our ordinance accordingly moving forward. And hopefully, moving forward, this will make our efforts consistent with the law. But how can we enforce? You know, part of the agreement is there's no enforcement. So it's like, what are we really doing this for? It's no enforcement. Well, the city has no power, no authority well, to it, enforce. No, it ultimately, even we get our tax rates. Well, no, ultimately, you know, once we give an abatement, we always have the ultimate power of removing the abatement. So that is the death penalty, so to speak. Now, the reason it's not in here, again, we, we're, we have to be very careful not to write this so that we are too much of a regulator and not a participant. We're, this ordinance is written to highlight that we are looking to be a participant in these types of projects moving forward. In the financial agreement, which is not an ordinance, obviously, but it's a document that we've, you've all seen before, we can put language in there that would provide a remedy if, in fact, they do not comply with our goals. Ultimately, the, the, the ultimate punishment, obviously, is a revocation of the redevelopment area financing. Throughout the period, whether it be phone conversation, whether it be just a meeting back in uh, in May, and and so the discussion was that the enforcement mechanism, whether it be inside of this ordinance or whether it be inside of the uh, the contract, the project, um, the agreement, it, it has to be written somewhere in. It. So um, I know right. at this point I don't feel comfortable in actually this the way it's currently written right now to have anyone vote on it because there's no mechanism in it for enforcement, even in the uh, contract or whatever side of it, because it's not written there. And there were specific recommendations yeah. that we made, such as um, the increasement of fines for the um, developer and for the labor unions. It was um, also, you know, we had a, a question about the legal uh, basis of the 20% number, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like where did that number come from? Because if you want someone to challenge it again, right. the 23%, which is mentioned inside of Croson, is a number that you can actually utilize as opposed to 20% that somebody can go after again because 20% is our hard target. So it was just a lot of um, questions and a lot of suggestions that I don't see currently inside of this right here that I don't feel comfortable in um, uh, I guess voting on this. Well, okay. I think essentially it's important to. This is an ordinance. We don't we don't adopt the financial agreements by ordinance. That's a, f a model agreement. And I think what's important to recognize is we have to shift our thinking from being a regulator to being a participant. If we're going to be a, a partner in these projects, which is the only way the court will acknowledge our ability to enforce a PLA, then it, it really comes down to an issue of contract. Each contract is going to have to be written and tailored to the particular project. And you know, one of the things we're going to have to figure out a, a fine line on moving forward is obviously the court has not told us exactly what a partnership means. I mean, one could argue that if you have a $300 million project, right, providing bike racks or a, redevelop a minor redevelopment area bond, the courts might not think that that is suitable to say, okay, you're a partner, right? We can't be de minimis. Obviously, the city's not going to be able to put up $200 million out of a $400 million project to be a 50-50 partner. So these 
agreements are going to have to have the flexibility to be able to be tailored according to the project. And it, it's very difficult to write something now and have it attached to every pro project moving forward. Now, what we can do is we, we, you could adopt this ordinance now, which does provide for remedies, which we leave flexible here, and an enforcement provision that the Department of, or the Division of Tax Abatement and Compliance would monitor. And then, by resolution, we could adopt a model financial agreement, which would give certain penalties as part of the financial agreement's uh, enforcement mechanism. Right now, the the department. Compliance. I just have a problem with compliance, even providing data, whatever that's suffice, whatever to the council to kind of mm -hmm. like talk about the monitoring and everything else like that. So I don't even give sufficient data, whatever in that regard. But to now have an ordinance, whereas the the enforcement is still loose, that even Pierre and the rest of the folks down there who work very hard. Um, they're going to have a problem with enforcement because the language is not written, whether it be in the ordinance or whether it be uh, inside of the contract, to kind of like go after anybody. And I know we want to be more so a participant, but this this project labor agreement is the only ch time that we get inside of the city to actually say that we're going to um, play a role in ha having people receive employment. And so if that's not explicitly written, like the fines and the penalties are supposed to go towards job training and the training of people so that we can create a pipeline so that individuals can be placed on sites and working throughout Jersey City. If that's not mentioned inside of this agreement, then we just have a haphazard whatever way of, um, of enforcing and then folks, whatever, like, there's no accountability. So like, I know we don't wanna, wanna put all these fines and stipulations <laughs> on people and it, it will discourage development and all the rest of those types of arguments. But this is the only way that we can protect to make sure that people actually work here uh, in Jersey City. These targets are something that I look at and say, but well, did you get that 20% on that mm -hmm. project? Did somebody eat? You know what I'm saying? Did somebody actually gain employment in the city? And that's, that's why I feel so strongly about making sure that that language is either in, inside mm -hmm. of the ordinance or inside of the financial agreement, which is hugely important. Like it so, has to be. John, can I? If I could just uh, interject, I'm sorry. Just to think about it. So you said that um, Councilman Gadsden said this is our only mechanism. So just some basics about this. So just if you can clarify for me, um, did the judge's ruling also apply to the PICA or strictly to the PLA? It, it only addressed project labor agreements. Doesn't discuss PICA agreements. That wasn't subject to the lawsuit. The PICA still stands as far as we. It hasn't been challenged. Right, so it's uh, okay. Councilman Young. We say a lot, but you said a lot, but you know, just to make us simplify that issue. So, PLA, what we have, used to we have, is illegal because without we mm -hmm. participating in financial participating and we tell them how many percent they have their so and so, illegal, right? So, now only one way we could control their labor agreements it would be a part of the financial agreement, which is mm -hmm. when we get tax abatement, we have a financial agreement. So now, instead we have a financial agreement, the PR agreement is separate, we just combine. That's all. Right? Could we combine the financial agreement? Yes, agreements? because That's why? What, what we call, when we give the tax abatement, we have a two portion, one, and a three portion. One is city ordinance itself. Mm -hmm. Second portion is your financial agreement. Mm -hmm. Third portion, PRA agreement. Mm -hmm. So when we have a separate paper as a PRA agreement, that's illegal because we, without financial uh, participating in the project, we do tell them what they have to do with illegal fine. Then, financial of the portion, we put it in PRA and the financial agreement, tell them mm -hmm. we're going to give it to you instead of 12% annual service charge, right. we're going to give 11% of annual service charge based on this agreement. And if you broke this agreement, your tax are going to revoke, you gotta pay a regular tax. So instead to put your separate, we just combine. But those kind of work, instead we do, we do it by citizens, more likely financial agreement itself. Yeah. So that's what it is, because already, tax abatement, we are part of participating in our financial issue. 
the, the, the pay tax is a financial issue, yes? And the, and the some uh, tax that we give to bond, yes, there's a financial agreement, I mean the financial issue participating in both. So bond, the court would regard bonding as yes. participation. It would not regard a tax abatement. Part of the, the financial participating. Instead we charge full tax, we only charge so much already is we participating finance. So if we see our ordinance, they will very simply say two items. Because we're gonna give to tax abatement based reason number one for the investor, number two, a developer, to make that their project is more like a, give us a marry. So financial government. So PRA get into financial government together. Let me ask you something. Is there any way that you can include a clause in here for us to refer to the financial agreement? So going forward, each each project would have a to look at their financial agreement in order for the enforcement to take place. The only way to enter into a, fin a tax abatement is with a financial agreement. So, well, we right. I, we so, so okay. Is there any way we can state it in this ordinance? See, the, the challenge we have here is it's not in the ordinance. The, you know, we can't enforce nothing here. It's nothing enforced. Well, no, Based not, on what he's saying, it would have to come through the financial agreement, but we don't feel comfortable just right, letting it go because we court, understand. The court doesn't want. If I, if I could, so the court wants. You, I understand the council would like to have this as a law, but the court says you can't do that by law. You're, you can do this if this is a contract and you are a participant. This is a project that you are partnering with a developer to build. If you're... Agreement, if you now follow the agreement, we can revoke the contract, which is a tax abatement. But if you wrote it inside the project labor agreement, section four, where it says compliance with the ordinance, it's written there. So you still have to put the teeth inside of the agreement. So because because it's here, but it just loosely uh, written. So I would just say put it in there. I mean, North right. does it, and I thought that you know we were modeling something after North because North has enforcement and they do what they need to do, and it's yeah, pretty efficient system based on what I discussed with the compliance officer there. But I just uh -huh. wanted. It's written so that they can do their jobs. And I don't know that Newark's ordinance has been challenged. Ours has, and the court struck it down. And the court was very clear why they struck it down. The court struck it down because. So, like, what, so, so we need oh. to have some teeth. Go ahead, I, I, I just, I guess maybe I have a, I, I have a fundamental question. So, I, I think that saying that we could take the tax abatement away is like made up because we would never do it because it's in our financial interest to always have the tax abatement. It makes more sense for us financially. So mm -hmm. like it's, it's like, oh yeah, we'll take it away, except for we'll never do that because we, we want the money, right? Yeah. So it's like, it's fake. We shouldn't even really use that as a, like saying it's something we would do. Mm -hmm. And so then it leads me to the question to say, that very logic, why wouldn't that apply to say that as a finite, that we have a skin in the game because we do have a skin in the game. We go to the first question. Yeah. Yeah. Court said that. Court said we don't. So that that's a moot point. Are we court decided. That? If we're are we still appealing that that conclusion or decision? I, mean, well, I, don't I, I agree with you. My decision. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, the problem. That should be the problem, right? So, John, yeah. can we do the instead that we discuss till probably not going to make any decision for regarding to this one? Why don't we do this one? Why don't you come up? Sample uh, financial agreement to include that the uh, uh, labor agreement together. Well, that's fine, but just so you know, a financial agreement. We don't adopt the language of a financial agreement by ordinance. So I mean, they they do as you've seen before. They do get modified. It's a template. They get modified based on the project. So what what I can certainly do, and I'll be glad to do that, is circulate a model financial agreement. We're st I'm still negotiating with the unions because the unions have to be on board as well because they're, it's not just, you know, those of us in this room that have to be okay with this language. A model financial agreement for both a long-term and a short-term tax abatement that would have remedy language in it. That would not, it would be my recommendation, we not put those remedies in the ordinance. We reference the, the, the model ordinance. I mean, the, the 
model agreement from right. the ordinance to say, and the abatement shall be based on the model, the model financial agreement, and put that right. language That's in the ordinance. Yes. We could. And That's sort of understood anyway. I mean, we the only way we enter into a uh, every every financial agreement is is adopted by you, right? Right. So, but in the Yes, right, ex exactly, and that's what we want to stress, that we are entering into a contractual agreement and we hold anyone in that agreement to whatever remedies exist at contract law. So, remember to highlight that we are a participant, yeah. Chris, let me finish. So, when we have a, a tax agreement to buy actually, say statute, if they're violating that the, uh, financial agreement, they have some kind of penalty, it's in there already. So, once in a while, when I read the uh, 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 tax abatement, they say state the provision so and so. Mm -hmm. If we not follow that the agreement, right. it will be fine so and so. It's there. So we never some tax abatement. Yes, it put in the you know things, but some agreement to that. But some of the you guys will take it out those things every time tax. Abatement. But used to be they do that. I'm telling you now. Okay, so so what I'm saying is they come up with sample agreement. So I mean the financial agreement include that uh, labor issue. So we all understand how we can regulate it. The financial agreement is, agreement is a contract. If they're violating, we can punish them by state statutes or based on the, what we spelled out the financial agreement. We're going to revoke the contract or if we not do that, they have to pay CWJ some kind of financial damage, pay $1,000 a day or $2,000 a month or whatever, you know what I'm saying. You can put it in. You're the lawyer. Why you give the headache to us? <laughs> you got to figure it out. Right? Go ahead, yes. you want to respond to that? Yes. Uh, so, like I said, what I, what I would be happy to do, I mean, we have this ordinance, you have a first reading, a second reading. It would be my recommendation that you introduce this, and then I can provide the council with model financial agreements that if you wish to adopt the model financial agreement by resolution, you could, but understanding that these have to be flexible for each project. So once we pass ordinance, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, when we make a financial agreement, it has not caused problems of what ordinance we pass to the other, I mean, the, the next time. That's why we got to be careful. That I'm, I think not only myself, right now most people are not comfortable. Correct. So, so the current law that exists is not, right. not uh, enforceable as it stands, right? Yeah. So there's really nothing in place yeah. at all at so, this point. I mean, my recommendation would be let's start somewhere mm -hmm. and modify it as necessary because otherwise, I mean, I, I, we tried to write this in a way to avoid future challenges that li left us the flexibility to put everything in a financial agreement and then, it, then it's governed by contract law. And then the parties that sign those agreements, they can't turn around and say, oh, well, you know, I don't, you, know, you signed it. So that, that's hard to challenge in a court of law. You, John, you, why does some committee not fully understand what's going on in these matters? Can we sit down with them before we have a second reading, have a meeting with a priest? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's I think another important factor is that back in March, um, everyone was all at the table, trades, mm -hmm. the mayor, like everybody was at the table discussing that. And there was supposed to be partnership. So you had referenced something to the fact that you still have to go back and talk whatever, to the trades union and everybody else to be on page because as far as this is concerned, every last local and everybody have to sign upon this too. So if they're not all in agreement with being... Uh, no, no, no. The council, the documents that you have in front of you have been vetted by the labor unions. They're fine with these. The thing I just want is that enforcement language in there right. that they agreed upon, like getting fined $500 for not uh, reporting for every man. Like all that language has to be in there so that, you know, it won't just be loosely interpreted. You know, that's the only thing. Let me, let me just, so, yeah, so let me just uh, jump in. I think the problem with the language that you guys are asking for is we are we're trying to write the ordinance in a way that doesn't make us a regulator. When you start putting fines and you start putting that kind of language in an ordinance, you look like a regulator. You're a regulator to the court. So there, there's no fines. There's no nothing you can do when somebody's out of compliance. Aside from the fictitious notion of us taking away somebody's tax abatement. No, you, you, put, you, put it, you put the, the, the remedy put it in, in the financial. Agreement. In the financial. And then it's an issue of contract. It's not a, it's not, so you, the court can't say, we're going to strike down your legislation. It's a contract. So not, not controlled by ordinance, controlled by contract. Right. 
Yeah. Okay. The law is strong. Right. It's strong. That's it proceeds lawfully. Well, I just want to clarify. That's just right. Is that? <laughs> no. So. What the parties have freedom to contract, so it's just it's a lot easier for us to. What what is the parties going to challenge when they go to court? Say, oh, we we didn't well, we we forced them to sign this contract. We we browbeat. They agreed to it. Whereas a reg, an ordinance can be challenged, and they could say, well, it's not constitutional. You're you're manipulating the marketplace. But if the parties agree to it, it's a lot harder for it to be challenged because the parties presumably came to the discussion and came to the agreement with free will. And, and, and an open mind. That's what they agreed to. It's, it's stronger for us to do it by contract. Now, I understand your reservations because you want to be able to point to something and say, aha, we've got them on lockdown. But the problem with that is that that's too easy to throw out. So it, it forces us to kind of shift our thinking from being regulators, in this case, to being participants. But so we regulate by contract. Yes. Yeah. You know, actually, some community civic associations who pay attention a lot about the peer agreement, they are, uh, didn't actually fully inform that issue. You know what I'm saying? So they're not fully informed that this one, this ordinance. So I, I not like aware to say, no, no, they're not aware of this. So why don't you sit down with them? You know what I'm saying? To make understand. So actual team effort to print city council, uh, law department, the city. I mean, the civic association, community leaders. We can work together with the union. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. So, Instead of some time with Barbara and NAACP, I think is what is being said here. Let's, uh, well, well, we're not going to take uh, general questions from, but Councilman Robinson. I think we all feel the same way about the enforcement, so I'm not going to beat that in the ground. But um, advertisement, um, page six, section uh, number seven C, it doesn't say anything about advertising locally. It it says um like TV commercials and an estate, the state of New Jersey newspaper. I think we should at least have something that, you know, goes into our publications that we use here. Uh, page six, you, no, no, not on the contract. Oh, okay. Uh, page six, number seven, C. Um, respectfully trade in a newspaper, regular distributed, or circulated within the state of New Jersey. Um, I'm thinking so, we should have something specifically for Jersey City. So I don't you know if you want to make sure Jersey City first. Right. So you put local yeah, local. Like, local. Jersey, not you can't say Jersey. You want to make sure word effort. You want to say yeah, Jersey. And, 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 and it should be, I mean, like, this is like not 100 years ago, right? right. So it, there should be language like li literally targeted to like zip codes, like because it's on Pandora or Facebook or Twitter or anywhere else. You could target to where the person is based on their mobile device, right. or based on their IP. So like we should make sure that if we're trying to really truly get Jersey City residents, that we're actually getting Jersey City residents, okay. and that it's not going to no offense, you know, but some pub yeah. trade publication or newspaper or magazine that. People here aren't reading. You can add that word in, can't well, you? What I can do is I will, Councilman Robinson, if you want, or any, I'll distribute that section uh, 7C to the council if you just want to email me with what, you know, whatever language you think is necessary. I mean, just tell me what you think I need to put in there. I'll put it in there. Advertisement must have to be local paper or local SNS, whatever. That's what they want to put it in. Okay? Good. Simple. Well, we're going to language with uh, yeah. yeah. I'll distribute it to everyone in the council. Just get back to me. Um, page eight, um, number one. The city will solicit the support of Jersey City Board of Education, Hudson County Community College. Um, what is, what kind of support are we looking for from those different agencies? Uh, well, this is actually so. This is the pre-apprenticeship training program. I I, uh, I believe this language is actually substantially similar to what existed in the PLA ordinance as it's currently written. Uh, I don't know what outreach, uh, tax abatement, and compliance has engaged in, or what the unions have engaged in. But it, it was my understanding that they had a history of working with these institutions, and so rather than you know, Reverend, maybe Reverend McRae could could speak more to that, but. 
it, it seemed like any opportunity to partner with a community stakeholder like institutions such as the ones listed here would be beneficial. I didn't see the need to take it out. But I, as far as actual what programs they have done, I, don't, I can't speak to that. Talking about minorities, right? The 20% making sure minorities, and we have a you know an organization, the NAACP, that probably should be on here. That's why I was trying to figure out what exactly was we soliciting their support for. Because if we're talking about minorities and we have a group such as the NAACP, we should probably solicit them as well. Urban League, right? All these all these entities listed here are public entities. They are either uh, you know subdivisions of the state or, or uh, of the county. And I, I think that the rationale for keeping it to public entities was not knowing where to cut it off. You know, I guess if you have too many private nonprofits, somebody would say, why did you leave mine out? Whereas, yeah, so I thought, <laughs> well, <laughs> representative for the NAACP said we can cut it off at the NAACP. So I, rather than tread it into that territory, we just kept it at public. I, that doesn't mean to exclude anyone, I don't think. It's just that these are, because they're existing government entities, they seemed like that was a natural fit to be able to partner with them. Disagree with including uh, right. okay, you profits, but you, maybe we can come up with some language that's uh, broader to encompass um, civic and other civic, nonprofits. Right. You've got Paco out there, you've got All sorts of um, other right. types of agencies that are doing lots of different right. things. And yes, we will get folks right. coming to us and saying, why, why don't you think that's right? It does say other community-based organizations, so it's not yeah. like it's excluding okay. anyone. It's just the list could get, right. you know, long after, after a while. Other comments and other questions? Um, is anyone watching on camera? If your if your name is not on this list, please do not write me letters. Please do not contact me. These folks here said the NAACP and the Urban League. Please, I'm just following orders. Board. <laughs> the labor board. Uh, there's a clause in there that talks about the labor board, and he wanted to have an understanding: what is the labor board? Who's the labor board? How is the labor board formed? Because uh, they make certain decisions. Oh uh, gosh, the labor organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, no, there was something in there. No, he talked about the labor board. So, so while he's up. Okay. This essentially deletes everything that's in there. Right? We're starting over. Uh, a lot of, it is in some ways substantially similar to the existing PLA. It's just that, you know, there's so many strike throughs and underlines, it would just become too difficult to, for you to read visually. So we're just starting over, making, also highlighting to the court that we're throwing out what they've told us to throw out, and now we're starting anew, and uh, starting anew in a way that is consistent with what the court ruling had stated. Page six of the uh, of the project labor agreement, Exhibit A. It says um, it says with the approval of it says in the event that the union either failed or unable to um, refer quali qualify resident minorities or you know that third paragraph. It says that paragraph four. Yeah. Okay. It says with the approval of the local administrative committee. Uh, experience in construction related areas may be acceptable as meeting the above requirement. Like, what is the um, local administrative committee and who, who, who does that, who's on it? Uh, I don't know who's on it. There's a PLA that you're referencing here. This is a model uh, project labor agreement that was promulgated by the Hudson County Building and Trades Council. And it's my understanding they have their own sort of subcommittees. And whatnot. So I don't I don't know who's on it, uh, but I could refer you to uh, Patrick Kelleher. I, I, I'm sure you've already spoken with Pat, and he can tell you who's on that. If, if they don't have anybody in, inside of the shop, whatever, then you know this ordinance basically says that that the developer can actually go outside and actually get qualified people to actually work on the site and actually get credit or whatever for it also. So I just wanted to make sure that this uh, board um, will allow whatever folks outside of the union to actually uh, participate on this, 
on a construction right. site. You know, so Community know. representation, so to, you want to make sure. We can yeah. Speak to Pat, or we bring in Pat, whatever you want to do. And yeah. Yeah. Councilman Rivera. John, my only concern was that like the COSA study was consistent with 23%, but we're at 20%. Yeah. So this number uh, was, we arrived at this number based on what the unions felt they, that was doable and deliverable now. Uh, the, the Croson study, really the Croson study's focus is on city purchasing, less so uh, abatements and, and development. So the number, uh, you know, is the byproduct of negotiations with the labor unions and what the Trades Council feels is deliverable. Um, if, if it ends up being that the number is challenged or, or the number itself is insufficient, the number can be changed. But I, I want to stress, we don't have anything right now. The courts have thrown out what we have. So, you know, um, we have to start somewhere. And it seems like at least the unions feel that they, that's a deliverable number, 20%. It, it could be changed, but just want to make sure that the 20% is, uh -huh. is based on something. See, 23 is based on the study. So that's why it would be better, whatever, especially with the city, whatever, becoming a participant. And, you know, you just want to just make sure whatever that language is there. Whatever. But the 20% could easily be challenged. If it's challenged, it's challenged. I mean, we, we can't anticipate every potential challenge that comes down the road. Uh, but right now, like I said, we, we have nothing. So... That we're asking them to use to, like the reason why it was thrown out, can I ask a few more specifics? Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with the fact that it was us saying you must negotiate with one entity. Because that makes sense to me why they would throw it out and why they would want for us to have a, a stake in the game. Like, oh, this is the, you know, these are the people we picked. Like, mm -hmm. this is the union that we picked for this and that's why we have a stake in the game. But if it were like if there were no if there were no if there was no PLA, and we said we want to have local hiring requirements, would would the same these same conversations be happening, or could we do something like that? I think we have we have a challenge from the same types of entities saying that you're you're not you know if you're going to tell people who they have to hire, then you should be a partner in the project. And as opposed and right now because actually. Um, there's been a lot of case law on this regarding other cities and, and, you know, not necessarily minority hiring, but just residential hiring that's been challenged. And they said, well, wait a second. It's not your project, so who are you to tell anyone who to hire? Um, that's the issue. Other questions for John? Comments regarding this? Okay. Hearing right. none. Thank you, Mr. Halloran. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, John. Still my okay. Bring up... Um, uh, Marianne Keller. Marianne has a 10Z4. 10Z4. If you haven't signed up uh, to speak with uh, at this caucus, please uh, see Margaret. And she will sign you up. If you're a member of the city staff. Is the resolution author authorizing the award of a competitively bid contract to Multimedia Solutions Corporation to develop the Healthier JC website? Z4. Z4. And Z4. Mary Ann, you wanted to say something? Take any questions? You also have uh, someone here? Or no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Ed Moskowitz is here from Multimedia Solutions in the event that you have any questions regarding the actual setup of the website. Also, a member of our Healthier JC partnership is here, Mira Prinz Array from the Jersey City Parks Coalition. So, this is a website that's going to do what? $64,000. Yeah. It's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. I'm really. The creative how's your Jersey website that kind of course have to be involved, really? Sixty fourth but actually I understand let me see, G so I was wondering was uh, G ten was right? What was it? G four. G four, I'm sorry. When I do some research yes. Yeah, so it's, I supported that idea, but I mean the cost of the creative webpage, sixty four thousand dollars is a whole lot of money. 
So now let me ask you this. Where did funding come from? And uh, uh, the budget wise, where did money come from the, uh, that programs? Okay. This is from the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health yes. grant. $1,000 over the four years. Yes. So each year they only, we get only received $50,000. Oh, so now, see, when I buy this research, actually $50,000, what else, where did other funds come from? So most of the, I, we did actually, the website was a little bit more than we had an originally anticipated. So we actually provided uh, a budget revision request to New Jersey Health Initiatives that administers the grant, and they approved uh, for this for this particular website. Uh, as, as the council president mentioned, we did have a review committee, which consisted, I you know, prepared a few comments just to give the whole council a little bit of context about this website. Uh, so that you understand how it's a little bit different than a, than a regular city website. What is the total budget of that uh, uh, healthier Georgia city that the division or whatever we call just we're going to create people under the health and human service and the created just one web page cost of sixty four thousand. How the funding was? Where the money come from? Robert Johnson grants. So you got an increase. How much was it increased by? Each year, only fifty thousand dollars come to them. So now fifty thousand dollars we're gonna get it, and we're gonna spend the sixty-four thousand dollars. But we don't know what is the maintenance cost per year. See now, here you go. Marion has all the answers for you. Sixty-five thousand dollars. Let me clear. Develop the program. Develop the end six months maintenance. Not $65,000 for whole year. $65,000 just create your software web page plus a six months maintenance. My, my, my question is that after six months, who's going to pay and where the money come from? Because we get the grant from the uh, Robert uh, Wood Johnson, $200,000 over the four years. So each year we only get $50,000. And uh, so now you, you tell me. And I know that the, you know I call it the Marian Keller is my little sister, but <laughs> the business is a business. You know what I'm saying? So I have to ask you. So you have to be answered. I interned for Councilman Young in college, so I'm used to this. Uh, you know, uh, if if you'd indulge me, I'll give you a really quick two-minute uh, contextual explanation of what this is and what this is about. Okay. Um, the Partnership for Healthier JC started in 2014. It is a core coalition of five. The uh, Jersey City Department of Health and Human Services, the, Jer the Jersey City Medical Center, Barnabas Health, New Jersey City University, the Jersey City Parks Coalition, and they were only chosen really because they're the only nonprofit in Jersey City that has citywide participation, all ages, all races, all creeds, uh, and every, every corner of the city is covered. The Jersey City Housing Authority, because we wanted uh, a group who could, uh, who understands barriers to health uh, when it comes to socioeconomics. And um, is that everybody? Uh, okay, five. So uh, basically, we applied in 2015 for the Culture of Health grant. And the requ requirement was that we had four, five partners, including ourselves. So we are technically, this website is for the use of these core partners, and then we, ex we intend to expand it. Uh, we spent the 2015, a lot of that year, on training uh, given by Robert Wood Johnson about researching data and how to better provide uh, a better culture of health in our community. Um, fortunately, one of the reasons why our budget request was approved, our change in budget, uh, Robert Wood Johnson didn't have the same requirements in year two and three for travel and training. So we spent a, a bit on travel and training the first year. So that savings is being applied to the more cost of the website. Um, in 2016, we did a lot of research. We actually contacted you, Councilman, and, and other council people um, to ensure that every one of our core coalition, um, unlike other communities, they took the Robert Wood Johnson grant and they said, you know, what? we're just going to work on farmers markets or we're just going to work on child health. In Jersey City, we were 
I was very happy to be with people who said, you know what, we want to make sure every single person can participate in this. This is about breaking down barriers for all. So what we did in the, in the next year was we spent a ton of time identifying stakeholders. Any community organization, any health provider in Jersey City is in our database. We have over 450 uh, stakeholders identified that we intend to reach out and um, reach out to to engage in the partnership. We also spent time researching our top six uh, urgent health needs. I did bring our blueprint for greater health in Jersey City. It was a lot of thought. It's the most thought I've done since college, actually. Um, and we educated ourselves about the top urgent health needs in Jersey City. Um, just want to give you a statistic so you're aware of it. Uh, in Jersey City, there are 1,990 uh, residents to one, um, one physician. So our primary care doctors, we are, you know, the, the state statistic is like 500 to 1. So we're really behind the eight ball. That's something that we can't exactly solve tomorrow, right? We can't just create a whole bunch of new doctors. But what we need to do is make sure the access and the barriers are broken down. And part of that is by breaking down silos. Um, our gut, our core group, believed um, that there's a disconnect. There actually are a lot of community agencies in Jersey City. You know, there's United Way, there's all these, all these places that do wonderful things. But what we noted uh, is that we really felt that people either don't know about it, right, or they're underutilized. Sure enough, um, Jersey City, uh, St. Peter's University nursing students last year when we were doing all this research did their capstone studies. They went ward by ward and did uh, inventory of all the services in the community, and they also inventoried the residents. And guess what? A lot of the services are underutilized and residents didn't know about it. And you know why that is? Because when it comes to s providing health care and social services, the last thing folks in that industry think about is marketing it and telling people about it. So we said, you know what we need in Jersey City? Um, you know, the city website's great. The medical center website's great. But you know what? None of them are providing exactly what we need, which is one place, one umbrella, where every single stakeholder in Jersey City can, number one, list their health programming for free. They can list it on a citywide community health calendar. So the, so the visioning behind this is, this is the place you, you're looking for a diabetes specialist, this is where you go. You want to know what Jersey City's top six urgent health needs are? This is where you go. Uh, in addition to that, we will provide many grants from that in the last year of the program from Robert Wood Johnson funding. It will all come from, from, the, from the grant, and we have engaged other partners like New Jersey Health Initiatives and others who are supporting our work, and uh, Director Flanagan has identified other resources as well. So I just wanted to give you a little context about why that is. Another quick thing this website will do, uh, one of the things we have, we have trouble with is, like, if there's an urgent health crisis, say, for example, there's a recall on child safety seats, right? We get that at the health department. We get that information from the CDC. We are not really always able to get that out as quickly as we'd like to. That's been a real pain point for us. And I know that our city council and certainly our department, when there is a recall of food, safety, or anything like that, or how about an outbreak of, of syphilis or, and these things have happened, folks, and we're not, we, you know, we're not always able to tell them. So I just wanted to give you the context behind it. I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not the techiest person, but I can tell you that our team really uh, thought that this was the best proposal because they actually showed us that they can provide us live Twitter feeds for the CD, from the CDC, the New Jersey State Department of Health, uh, the Federal Department of Health. So. Marian, I never question your job, and uh, you know, really, you do a fantastic job. Always, you provide uh, the cultural fair anywhere you go, and uh, even though you work for us, our organization, you know, Central Urban SID, I never question you. So, but the irony questioning that 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 the uh, cost of the build of the website, but after that, sixty-four thousand dollars every year, the maintenance cost is only thirty-one thousand dollars. Not only, only thirty-one thousand dollars. We build up some kind of a, a tool to connect with the people per year, 31,000 is reasonable. You know, but my question was that, are really that much expensive when pay to create? That's what it is. And in six months. Well, you know. the, the proposals range, you know, from way higher than that. 
and uh, some came in real low. The few that came in really low, what we found was they didn't have, they had overseas folks uh, that managing our website. This team did come in, very impressive. A number of them have roots in Jersey City. They are in Edgewater. I know we can't discriminate based on location, but they certainly appeared to really know our city. Uh, to $64,000. After that, $31,000. We got no problem. I'm preaching not only myself, all the council to something, you know. But I feel like I believe that. Well, know? Councilman, just so you know, we have talked about sustainability. So I hear what you have to say. I mean, I definitely think it's an important concern. Our hope is that this website is going to be really useful and um, really dynamic. And perhaps we've talked about later down the line, maybe some membership fees and or things like that. But uh, for right now, we have the money to get it going yes. and some, some supportive money for the overflow. That's what I'm saying. Only 50, so you have a five organization, only when I see the two organizations can have a put a dollar, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to make sure as a councilman, we want to make sure that taxpayer dollar spend or, you know, or more wisely, you know what I'm saying? That's what it comes to. All right, good. Hearing none, thank you, Marianne. Uh, Director Shea, you're up. Uh, which item is here for? Is here for the police talk, the fire contract? Fire contract? I got a couple here. Okay, hold on. I need more. Oh, I thought you only had one. You're doing Astro? You're doing the. I got a grant from the Prosecutor's Office to purchase the body cameras under the Bywall Camera Assistance Program. Agenda number 10.K. 10K. I got a resolution authorizing the execution of the agreement between us and Ten K is the first item. Ten K. Resolution authorizing acceptance of a grant from the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office for the purchase of body cameras under the Body Worn Cameras BWC Assistance Program. Yeah, uh, just to bring everyone up to speed, this is a state program where the prosecutor's office made $100,000 available for the purchase of hard items. You can't use it for contracts or for support. It has to be to purchase body cameras, that $100,000. We have not taken advantage of it up till now because we haven't had our back end ready. We, haven't, we didn't want to buy cameras and find out we were committing to millions of dollars in support that we had to do for them. Uh, at this point, though, it's about to expire, and we're confident that we need these cameras and can support them. Everybody knows we're also working with a separate body camera program involving phones that the officers' phones can use. We plan on using them together. Uh, we found that some officers' assignments are more conducive to having a hard body camera with a hard clip. Others, such as detectives, are more conducive to using a phone that's less threatening and can be turned on and off at their need if, in case they're involved in enforcement. So we plan on making both available and essentially making it the officer's choice, but they'll have to choose one or the other. So that removes the uh, this doesn't work for me kind of thing. We're going to give them two options. Ten K, hearing none. You'll get your What's your next item? <laughs> oh, Rich. Oh, you want to bring up something else? You wanted to bring up another item. Hold on, you got my Folks, Councilman Bogiano wants to diverge from the agenda. Well, to the director, and yeah. I think we've solved most of the problems. But I just want to know to this council that any time, and my 36 years in the police department and 40 years in policing, that. Uh, when there are promotions of any kind, this council should be notified. And uh, I know for myself, and I think Franny agrees with me, and Danny, and I hope the rest of you agree with me, that we should be notified uh, of what's going on. And it came as a complete surprise what went on the other day. I'm not blaming you, Director. It's uh, the way this city's been operating for the last three and a half years, but it's got to change. This council has to be notified. Or should be notified. As Director Shea, actually, I know that you give the last minute notify to us. We understand that part of it. But we're not promoting 
a private security guard, you know what I'm saying? We're promoting public officer. You know, there are those people fight for and protect the people of Georgia City. So those kind of things is very honorable things. Every individual get the promoted. So I like to have at least we get like a three days of notice, you know, I think as a proper, you know. So because promotion is tomorrow, we get the notice that like uh, 10 hours or six hours before, oh, we're gonna have a promotion to ask you show. That's why actually last promotion, I get protested at because I'm not happy with that. You know, so now on, you know, our term is only till end of the December, but we gotta show some kind of, I don't know they have a promotion or not, but some show to respect each other, you know. That's what actually we're looking for. If it's uh, those kind of things uh, beyond the years, pay, no, what can I say? Sorry, but I think I said right. Okay. Yeah. We ask reasonable things, right? Yes. <laughs> it is reasonable. Very reasonable. Yeah, I guess I will say it. Um, it's reasonable. I, I agree with you, Rich, and um, that appropriate notice, Vanzos, in defense of Director Shea, I think, is that uh, um, once the notices go out, I said, I've said this in the past, so it's nothing, nothing new, is that. Uh, um, and then uh, officers start to call council members and say, I'd like to get, oh, how come, I, come I'm not on the promotion list and so <laughs> forth. And then he gets uh, some calls from other uh, members of the city council and other things like that. And that's why they probably do what the, kind of the, uh, the last minute. I'm not saying we, we should get appropriate notice. I understand. Oh, not. But the thing is that we should be notified as the governing body of the I agree. I agree. Oh, okay. by the way, I think I would, that the director, I have to say this one. I thank you to Jersey Police Department and the leadership of the, uh, Director Shea. Everybody probably remember that 2014, one of the businessmen in the journal square get gunned down by yeah. a bad person like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I heard that they got them. Yeah, you know, so right. anybody committed crime in Georgia City, our police department working so hard, bring them there to justice, right? So I really thank you for that, right. you know, Director Shea. Give us a good hand from my side. <laughs> Murder, as you know, of an innocent shopkeeper, and I'd like to co congratulate the Hudson County Prosecutor's Office Homicide Unit also, who had the lead on it, and all people who worked with them on it relentlessly until now to make that arrest. So yes, he'll be charged today, so we're happy about that. When he see that there's some instance, it bothered him so much. When I heard that, I'm so thank you to him. He care about the people of Georgia yeah. City. If we not care about people of City, not going to bother in any instance. But when he said that, Councilman Michael, you say it was bothering me so much every instance. I really thank you for that. You you know put your heart in the in the Georgia City. Appreciate it. Okay. Okay. Your next item. Thank you. A resolution authorizing the execution of an agreement between the City of Jersey City <coughs> and the Uniform Fire Association of Jersey City Local 1064. IA double F, AFL CIO, CLC. Okay, any questions? Uh, just a background this is the second of our four uniform. Uh, unions that we have reached a contract with after some hard-fought negotiations uh, between myself and uh, Bobby and our negotiator and the unions. Uh, again, they were tough, but they were always honest, so we reached an agreement. Uh, we have reached a memorandum of understanding with the police superiors, which they will be voting on this week, and uh, we hope to keep moving forward with the police officers. So. Uh, over the year, I think we've got a lot accomplished. Uh, if you asked myself and the union president which of us is happy with this contract, I think both of us would say no. <laughs> I wish I got more, and so you know, and so did he. So it's probably as fair as we were going to arrive at. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> and the union president is here. If anyone has any questions of him, either. and I'd like to just publicly, I would like to thank him for a tough but an honest negotiation. <laughs> All right, next item, 10X. Resolution authorizing the city of Jersey City, Department of Public Safety, Fire Division, to enter into a memorandum of agreement with the United States Coast Guard. 
Uh, this is just formalizing communications. Doesn't cost anything, just gives us permission to put them on our channel so we can talk to each other in the event of a water rescue like the recent tragedy involving the Navy skydiving team. Z6. Z6. Authorizing the award to Astra Software Corporation to provide annual support and enhancement to the Department of Public Safety, Division of Communications and Technology, Computer Aided Dispatch System, pursuant to the applicable statute. Yeah, this is just Director. the annual maintenance for our computer aided dispatch system. It hasn't increased from last year. It's just that this is what it costs for our support and our maintenance of the system. So, yep. I should the person who charge of that is a Bob Bacon. I think we taxpayer, not only the city council, recognize him as hard work. Actually, last year we paid more than 22500 but he's a tough negotiator of vendors. He loaded that actually. 22,000 down to 22,500. And uh, we have to understand not only ourselves and the unknown city employee, the behind the scene, they work so hard to save taxpayers a dollar. So, you know, I try to the comment that the, what he did, great job. You know? yeah. All right? I agree. He does an excellent, excellent job over there. He has one of the toughest jobs in the city. And um, it's a very unforgiving one. If the 911 system goes down, no one's going to want to hear any excuses. So, yeah, I agree. Um, he deserves kudos for what he's doing over there with a workforce and with technology problems. And he's one of our most valuable employees. And in addition, uh, himself and Chris have taken on the Body One Camera program, our CCTV program that I gave some of you a, pers you know, a private uh, update on, and several other programs that we're very excited about, too. So. He's um he's a he's he's an asset to the city and he lives here and he lo and he loves Jersey City. At the reduced cost, those that's the reason actually delayed in resolution. So tell them city council willing to wait to get their low cost of that. Yes, yeah. <laughs> the great job. Okay. By the way, he did get the marriage pay. What's that? Mary pay this year. Uh, we we. We shouldn't be discussed that, but he, we, are well aware, we are well aware of his importance and his contributions and how hard he works. Okay, Thank you. Okay, is there any other additional items? No, that's all. That's it? Okay. Thank, Thank you, Director Shea. Um, we have uh, Vivian Webb and Katiana Scalcion. Yes. <coughs> you have a resolution. It's a, uh, you know the number? What's up? 10 Z5. It's the late item that Robert one of them. Z18. Z18. It's a late item. Just to hand it out by uh, <coughs> city clerk. of the City of Jersey City, authorizing renewal of a professional services agreement to pediatric consultant, Dr. Solomon Wasu. You want to say anything about that? Uh, <coughs> no, we are looking for the execution of Dr. Wasu's contract. His contract was held. Um, we had alternate, I'm sorry, Katiana Scalione. The contract was originally held for alternate consideration. Health and human, I'm sorry. Oh, health I'm sorry. and human services is the pediatric doctor just renewing his contract for six months till the end of the year. Normally you hear from Stacy. She's yeah, Katiana is, is from HHS. Stacy's on leave of absence for a few weeks. Whoa. Okay, any questions for um, Katiana on this? Hearing none, thank you. <laughs> that was quick. Uh, Angela Davis, also here um, in lieu of uh, Stacy. And it's 10Z5. And this is a resolution authorizing an agreement between 
share our strength in the City of Jersey City uh, regarding the Cooking Matters program. Anything you want to say about that? It's an ongoing program, just for TV purposes. So, yeah, my name is Angela Davis. I'm the director of our Division of Food and Nutrition. Uh, we are partnering with Cooking Matters, which is a national organization through Share Our Strength, to offer a curriculum that we've partnered with, like Jersey City Medical Center and also at our WIC Center, just teaching residents, especially who are low income, how to eat healthy on a budget. And that's basically what the curriculum involves. And they're just licensing us to use the curriculum for the next uh, program year, which goes from July 1st through June 30th of next year. Yes. Would that information be the type of thing that would be like Healthier digitized Jersey. on put on and on Healthier Jersey City? Uh, I can look into that and see what the uh, licensing agreement allows us to do. So far, we've just used like booklets that we give to the to the residents. Um, so they've done like virtual. They've done actually cooking tours at some of the grocery stores like Shoprite, and then other times we've actually just done virtual ones as well. Um, and we give them a little booklet that goes with it. But they're they're developing a lot more of materials. So I'll, I'll see if there actually are online materials. And over again, yeah. Um, even even the tour, if it was digitized, like if you taped taped a session and, yeah. and you could put it on the site and it could be reused over. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, I'll host it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No. Okay. Thank you. Fun. Okay. Thank you. Next uh, is Brooke here. Okay. Steve Miller. Steve has 10 Y. Is he here? Okay. Oh, Steve is here. 10 Y. 10 Y is the extension of the agreement with the Board of Education. That's a three year agreement for reimbursement of gas and diesel fuel. This is an extension. Yeah, it's, it's an annual. It ends, contract it's a three year agreement, so third year is up. It's a 5% is uh, law. What is the reason Board of Ed, Board of School, that incepted their own things, they, why they use ours? Is there any reason? They don't have their own. Oh, they don't have their own facility, too. Right. Okay, I see. Yeah, before this, they used gas stations. So this way they come to. The public works complex for their buses, primarily. So how much do you use? They reimburse us about a hundred thousand dollars each year for their That's use. Old. Yeah. And um, it varies depending on the price of gas and diesel fuel. So, so some years is less, some is less. They are revenue to city. So they pay hundred thousand dollars city. So 5% uh, admission fee, right? Yes. <coughs> okay. Okay. Um, my own comment is actually for um, the BA is that um, the, as we all know, the, the schools has a $8.5 million shortfall in funding on the state side. And I think the mayor just recently announced that, um, that uh, we'd help to close that gap. Yes. So um, I'm... I don't know if this is part of that, but maybe we can help a little further so if that works for both of us. So, I mean, uh, related to that, the, uh, there's a summer program run by recreation for the uh, disabled students uh, where the Board of Ed provides the buses. And historically, you know, they would pay for the gas. But this summer, we're going to waive that because it is our program, our kids. Uh, so this year, we will pay for the gas for the, for the Board of Ed that way, helping them out. So. That's a cost they won't incur. Uh, related to the mayor's announcement, uh, working with Dr. Lyles, uh, moving forward, you know, budgetarily wise, the, you know, each year the, the Board of Ed reimburses us for police services within the schools. We provide you know, resource officers and we provide security at various off, uh, right, within the schools. Uh, we are looking to waive that, not this year, it will be in next year's budget. Because they're on a fiscal year, so it impacts their 17-18 budget, our, it will not have any impact on this year's budget. It's a 2018 issue for us. Uh, that is approximately $2 million that the city is going to be absorbing to help the schools close their gap. Uh, the other thing we're looking to do is that they have some after-school programs that we think our recreation department can take the lead on. 
uh, which will help them in terms of uh, the, the supervision and the people who run the programs. They are forced to pay uh, their teachers and, and you know their employees uh, overtime at a, at a union rate, whereas you know if our employees are running it, it saves the board money. So we're going to meet with Dr. Lyles, with Director Williamson and his staff, and, and see what programs uh, we can work out with them. Right now, there's a middle school program, after school uh, athletic program with you know the basketball, volleyball, something that we already do, and that we just want to incorporate them into our program. How much is that asked? Uh, that is about three hundred fifty thousand dollars. There's also some issues with the custodians at Cave and Point. We're going to work with them on that since we we pretty much maintain that field. How can we work that out? And also maybe the, some of the private schools that use Cave and Point, you know, they charge a fee to play for their games. Maybe that some of that fee should come and offset some of the costs related to you know, staff in there. So that, these are things that we're working on with with the Board of Ed. So maybe look at this. Yes. Time's up. My, 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 by my math, that doesn't come to 8.5 million, but it's uh, no, no, maybe we, you want to take a look at some of this, this no, hundred thousand. We're, uh, we're looking at 2.5, we're looking at like we're closer to 3 million. The schools identifying the other five or six million, so okay, yeah, I, I can't speak to what they're, they're cutting, great, but we're this is what our, our we're doing to help. <coughs> okay, any other questions for Steve on this? Hearing none, thank you, Steve. Did uh, Brooke make it back in here? Where is she? Brooke Hansen? Oh. Brooke has 10J. Let's go back to 10J. Go backwards. J is a resolution authorizing the risk manager to issue a certificate of insurance to Mecca and Sons Trucking Company at 580 Marine Boulevard for the coverage of a mural project as part of Jersey City Graffiti Mitigation Program. So what number is this? It's so over, by the, Holland, over <laughs> by the Holland Tunnel. Mm -hmm. Want to say anything about this? Uh, I have images here if people would like to see them before and after. I can pass that around. Okay. Want to see that? And this is an example of a mural this artist has already created with us. So he's one of our locals. And this is going to be, yeah, this is one of my favorites. Uh, this one, surface-wise, is going to be even bigger than David Bowie. Um, and this is one of our local artists, and, and is a very, very Jersey City mural. So we are, we're really excited about it. And then this, we can pass that around. That's what he's already produced. Wow, great, great. Before and after. Yeah, great. But let me ask you, this is my question is all the time. When we, City of Jersey, when you open mural program, then money comes from the where? State? Clean neighbor, whatever they call it. Clean community. So we get $309,000, and the some portion go to street maintenance cleaning, and the some dollars go to the mural program. Because the mural program is actually one part of that clean community project because of they will prevent graffiti. But let me see this one. That's cool. Yeah. These look like me. Yeah, but who's <laughs> going to be graffiti on the top of the building? <coughs> and actually, we pay, we pay paint, primary, and artist. Mm -hmm. So the basis of these buildings get uh, tagged. This one in particular, uh, one way that uh, art taggers tag buildings is with paint sprayers and sometimes you'll see that these uh, tags get really big and that's what happened to this building here um, but whether they're painting just one story or three stories our stipends are very small um, and increasingly because of the popularity of the mural program we're able to partner with private property owners and developers who are then subsidizing the cost of the murals so our mural costs that that mural costs us about three thousand dollars about three thousand dollars. Land the property owners. Yeah, property owners help to contribute to cover the cost of the stipends. Sometimes they rent the equipment for us if it's too large because I don't I don't you know rent equipment out of my budget. Uh, so I just want to make sure that the grant what we spend not more than beyond that. We're spending about 30% of the Clean Communities Grant on an anti-graffiti program that has proven to be 99.9% .9 effective. 
And additionally, we're engaging graffiti vandals as well, because when they're arrested, they're assigned to the Department of Public Works. So we're helping to... To address your concerns, could the VA provide a, an itemized expenditure for the clean communities and how it relates specifically within the graffiti program? Director Stamato's got it. Yeah, yes. okay, great. Does that work, Councilman? Okay, great. Any, any questions for Brooke on this? Can I ask you about the public committee process? Um, uh, how is that work? How is that applying in this particular instance or any others? Well, I guess. So this has been passed through our board. So we have a public art advisory board um, and we have board meetings monthly. There's seven members um, and they review all mural pr uh, proposals that are internally vetted by JC Map. Uh, by the time they get to the board, uh, they have before and after shots, uh, bio of the artist, reason why we're putting it there, um, and then community petition supports. So it, it shows that we have uh, support from the community within a one mile radius of every project that we put up. That you actually accepted more people, uh, like more members. Uh, on the board? Yeah. The board was created by uh, is executive order by the mayor, and it's a seven-member board, and it's all been filled. Okay. Any, any other questions for Brooke? Fill top circle, what is that? Okay is also another uh, mural program that's run in the city, um, and we're partnering with him on this project. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you. All right, we've got uh, Carmen 10H. <laughs> Folks, 10H for Carmen Gandula. That's the approval of the <laughs> Fiscal year 2017 annual application action plan and authorizing submission of the application to the United States Department of Housing and Urban Development. You want to say about this card? So we've been awarded by HUD? So we've, um, we've been conditionally awarded as of um, May uh, 15th. HUD gave the city um, its approval for this year. Um, our fiscal dollars from last year to this year, we were cut about 8% um, in this year's budget. So that equates to about $400,000 less that we received in fiscal 16 um, going into fiscal 17. So um, what you have here before you is a proposal, despite the fact you see a resolution, it's an actual plan that we have to draft and submit to HUD uh, in order for the city to receive these dollars. So the resolution before you today is to allow us to submit this proposal so that therefore HUD can then return, turn around, approve the funding. So I'll probably be back in September for another resolution asking um, that we accept the dollars that HUD is being proposed um, in this given time. And so similar to the last couple of years or previous years, we go through an orientation session this year we had an orientation session in March. We had about 200 people that attended. I think, Council President, you did attend and attended our public hearing. And um, we've taken surveys, um, I would say, from the community. People have been concerned. Um, uh, a lot of our comments that we received on public record for this year were, were concerns. A lot of um, those that are affected in the, the homeless space, those affected in the HIV community and AIDS space, um, came to our public hearing asking for more funding. Um, today I wear my button that says CDG works because um, I think in light of the past previous years and considerations, um, the particular budget that was proposed <coughs> from HUD was zero dollars to CDBG and zero dollars to home. Um, I will say the preliminary, the last report that I got, um, the House subcommittee did um, preliminary start budget for fiscal 16 and um, for CDBG nationally, it's 2.9 billion, which is $100 million less than what we got in um, previous years. Um, and then the home grant is 850 million um, that's being proposed right now um, in the House uh, subcommittee. And that's also um, about $1.2 billion less from years over year. Uh, for Jersey City, if I were to sit here and give you numbers, um, a couple months ago, I was here for the um, budget meeting just to give you know a perspective of what's happening. In 2012, for CDBG, we had 7.5 million dollars. Um, 
in home we had about 4.1 and in Hopple we had about three million dollars in 2012 and in 2016 um, in, not comparing this year's numbers we have 5.4 million dollars um, in CDBG home we have 1.3 and then Hopple we have 2.3 but as an update for Hopple I'm actually going to Florida next month to go through what's called the um, Modernization Act of Hopwa, and so the funding allocation is going to be less for Hopwa um, because there are more people living longer um, with you know, AIDS and HIV, and so the budget proposals that are preliminary, you know, year one for next year is about $22,000 less. In fiscal 18, they're projecting either anywhere from range of $120,000 to $288,000 less to Jersey City. So. Um, yes, I'm here before you today to ask that you accept the draft of the annual action plan, but I'm also here to be on the record to say that this program that's been in existence at the federal level over 40 years has worked. Um, and then coming next year, I may ask for some, some support and really looking at from a deeper perspective fiscally um, in, in our plans. So, any questions? Questions for Councilor um, Gadsden? You had some. At the last meeting, you'd raise some issues or questions no, about allocations. I was looking forward to the budget, and this is one yeah. of those things that we have to, I guess, amend the budget and put this in, right? Mm -hmm. the, um, it won't be itemized in the budget. It'll just be. No, it'll just be. Yeah, 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 yeah what all those end numbers are. Councilman, you and Councilman yeah. Robinson. Yeah, just one question. The Palace Side Emergency Regency Corporation, what is that? It's a shelter. Yep, it's um, it's a in the Palisades is a homeless shelter in Union City that we fund. Um, it's part of our uh, COC, a coordinated entry. Um, that there is an overflow uh, shelter that residents that are homeless do stay in that facility, um, and so we do fund a portion of of those dollars. Yep. Uh, Robinson and Jackson. Uh, the eleven thousand that we're given to the Urban League are those the funds that we spoke about? Um, I guess last week. So um, the use of the Urban League was, we spoke about fiscal um, last year's summer budget, not this year's budget. So it's separate issue, different budget years. But um, as of Friday, I want to say that they submitted to me, to my staff, um, the outstanding items so that they can be reimbursed for last year's summer program. Okay, this is for this year. This is for proposing, well, yeah, for this year, so 17. Yep. I had a question. Um, sure. I guess two things. I remember speaking back in, um, I guess, couple, I guess last month. Yep. Um, about like how how the monies are being spent by the various organizations. Right. Uh, recently, I just heard that Rising Tide uh, Capital is participating in um, getting uh, former inmates and folks like that, uh, kind of like training and things like that to become like entrepreneurs and all the rest of that type of stuff. Okay. Can you, is there a way to break down like the, the cost of that type of a project within the scope of like say the $200,000 that's rising tide is receiving <coughs> funding and, so and, want, like, and all those monies being used for that program? Or? You just want like a cost allocation as like a client rate, <coughs> the cost of, of, of um, a breakdown of what that particular organization is doing in the in this funding grant yeah. yeah i can i don't have it here today but i can get you yeah. right, any other questions for carmen okay i i have um so with the with the council's authorization of this does this finalize the allocations for each of the subrecipients or is it uh, still able to be amended after this <laughs> the answer but I'm out of time um, uh, in the sense of um, I have to turn this in to HUD before um, August 16th legally, but I've already told HUD that at the end of um, July 30th is when we were going to submit this. So understand that this report now has to get input into our federal system and with the adoption of, of this, um, we now have two weeks to submit all this into what we need. So. Um, if there are further questions that need to be upheld, yes, I will answer and take everything else. So just know that you're putting pressure on us to, to try to get things done by the 16th. So if you have questions, um, and considering the allocations are very late this year, 
Uh, we've been very, very under the clock, and normally I, I receive our budget. We're supposed to get it in October, but last couple of years I got in January, February. This year I got it in June, and who knows what's going to happen next as we all watch the news. So uh, let me ask you about the youth summer programs. Is this um, just going back to what we we're talking about with the Jersey City Public Schools on the summer um, recreation or an after-school type programs? Is this um, part of that uh, allocation that's going to be shared services? I mean, it's something that can be considered. So understand that we set aside right now youth funding for next year for people to apply for this pro for this particular grant. So if there's discussions in regards to incorporating some of these dollars, understand that people will apply next year, next summer for their programming, and you know, have a conversation with the business administrator, whoever needs to, you know, we've, we've set aside 100,000 for it, so it can be considered. But summer funding for this year has already been, is under review right now, and so there's, we're kind of sort of, I got like 18 applications in for this summer, and I'll be coming back next month to um, go over those recommendations and those proposals. But it can be considered. Total set aside. When does that pull out for? I guess RFP or. The total set aside is a requirement that. Part of the home grant that we have um, at a minimum 50% of our budget has to be set aside for Choto. Currently, right now, we did not get a Choto application in. Mm -hmm. So um, I have two years to commit um, these funds um, from this particular budget date. So um, because I also am the chairperson. So we can put it into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund RFP. It's a consolidated approach now that my office, we kind of sort of look at all the grants. Um, or we can RFP it at, at a later date. But I do have two years to it's commit. It's still be set aside for a choda. It's still be set aside for a choda. Yep. Okay. And then um, let me ask about uh, every year we have this issue with uh, fire victims being displaced and so forth. 46 Jones Street. Can you just speak to how much is being allocated here and what the so, change is, if any? Um, after we've increased it since um, I've been um, the director, so we used to set aside like 50000 75000 The last two years we've set aside 100000 so under the subrecipient, this is relocation. We're setting aside $100,000 for relocation assistance um, for the upcoming f uh, fiscal year. 100000 um, uh, If you look at the where it says CDBG relocation, Oh, relocation. Relocation, 100,000. Um, as uh, as Councilman, I'd love to say that um, going on the federal calendar and the cuts that Jersey City has received with CDBG in 2012, I had seven million dollars. I had now have am working with five million dollars, and so I I would like to allocate more dollars um, to this program. I have to consider everything related to the grant process, right? Public services, infrastructure, um, housing, um, development, and a lot of things, and so. Again, going back to the comment that I would really like the council to take in consideration that CDBG does work, and I would like to see support, you know, going forward in regards to just mirroring or matching in some capacity, so that my office could expand. But that's further discussions outside of this meeting. Next year, yeah. next year, I'm, I'm, I've got my bin. We work, we get it done. And uh, when you have something, the just issue in Jersey, natural or man-made, doesn't matter. So I bring up that issue since 2014. Actually, this size of city. We should some have a fund for a relocation fund, but hundred thousand dollars, you know, really very very minimum. There any way we can city of Jersey can fund the other add to their what they have? Overall, not just relocation, but overall, and um, I would love to explore all of my funding here, right? Um, but that's just, I think a separate meeting with the business administrator. I do have some proposals um, in regards to funding. That I, were you in the budget meeting or? I gave this out um, in regards to some type of conditional reports and other things. But yes, I, I would love more funding. All right. Um, understand the community development is 100% funded by HUD. So, and outside of the Affordable Housing Trust Fund grant that I also manage from the city, I don't take any admin dollars uh, yet from that fund um, and probably will be asking permission and considerations in, in months to come. I mean, there's still funding a little bit. Dollar, extra dollars. If we not use it, we can take it back as a surplus. Yeah, we cannot do that anything like so that. So you can create a line item in one of the department's budgets right. for this purpose. Uh, but you're going to have to create a criteria of how it's going to be used. Yeah, what type of emergency that. gets used? How do you pick and choose who gets who doesn't? <coughs> that's always a sensitive issue. Right. But, but, but what I'm saying is that you, you can do your 
$800,000, when you spend the dollars, you have a certain uh, rules or regulation you're going to be set up. It's the same rules and regulation. We're going to apply for that, what we're gonna, how we're going to spend our funding. I think that's a very important part of it. You know, when your population, more than 250,000 you know, people to leave, and uh, still we have uh, rich people and poor people when you have it together, and a lot of housing stock in Georgia City over 100 years old, they have great risk of having those things happen. So $100,000 is not, but if we able to create, still we got time. We do. You know, some items. Bob, you are the one. What do you think? Um, and we never do the city of Georgia City in over the years, but I hope this is the first step under this still full of administration have some reachable fund for just emergency situation like the way the CD has. Set aside in this year's budget. It has to be something you create for next year's budget. I guess um, a lot of times I have a lot of things on my brain, so it's hard to get the question out. But back to my original question, I think I asked about like how. Um, the organization like Rising Tide, whatever is Alec, yeah. is using that 200 whatever thousand dollars, whatever that they have, because I think in our conversation, like the scope in which they said that they are going to use the money for low income residents for job training and preparation. And I was saying to myself, well, there's, there's another organization here that's a, a public service program like the Jersey City Employment and Training Commission. Mm -hmm. that sometimes the wording is like a duplication of like, what they are doing, right? So I was saying, is there, and, and, is there a way, whatever, to take the funding, whatever, from one place to put it into another place? Because this, what, this, uh, what Jersey City uh, Employment and Training um, sole purpose is to create this pipeline and to create employment and all the rest of that stuff. We take that money from one and give it to the other. So you're saying you want to reallocate money from Rising Tide over to Jersey City? Employment and training. Something like that, or it, it, it's already set in stone. No, so yes, yes. Yes. Correct me if I'm wrong, but if uh, you want to demand it, you can make a motion. You need uh, five council people to approve it. And, uh, For the data to say how effective has Rising Tide been in helping low-income residents in Jersey City receive job training because I know they do the entrepreneurial, whatever right. type of stuff, but when you start talking about job training, and in light of the conversations that I've been having with um, Reverend McRae and just them over there, I was like, how are we gonna create this pipeline? How are we gonna get people whatever working? And who's providing the training to do it? And so how effective is Rising Tide in doing it? Okay. And how effective are they in doing it? And if they can't do it, it's because they don't have the resources and money. So then maybe money should be reallocated from here to go over there. So I just need data more so, so I can justify a you know, decision. I mean, is economic development the, the program? Mm -hmm. um, is that uh, exclusively job training? So it's economic development. So um, to answer your question, um, Anyone can apply to my grants, right? And I can't stop anyone from applying. And I think to give the answer and fairness to each organization that does apply, one of our priorities in our consolidated plan, which we write a five-year strategic plan through, is economic development and the growth of people being able to create jobs. And both um, JSEP and Rising Tide both do are in working in that space. Ideally, their objectives and the clients who they serve are different. And so what is the base model for HUD is basing it on those that are low to moderate income. And so if you're, I think, questioning the, the outcomes and the measurement, the performance, I, I would say that I will provide you with the data and the report, but the person that are able to answer are those exact organizations. And so for me, as, as a funder, as a funder and administrator of these federal programs, I'm measuring, did they, you know, did they meet the threshold criteria? Are these in line with the national objectives? Are these meeting the th our, our needs in, in our plans? And so where I can get you a cost allocation of a budget or a breakdown, but I think that the narrative and the discussion does need to be discussed in, in, um, with those agencies. Is the economic, the economic development program about creating jobs or it's, it's about placing jobs? Creating jobs, placing jobs. It, it's about, you know, when we did our, yeah, I would both. Say, I would argue that necessarily create jobs. It's about job training and placement. Right. Um, but so. it's, 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 it's both, right? So it's both, right? It's, it's the, the biggest need that came out of our survey were 
happens after the institution of employment and training, Jersey City Employment and Training, is not dedicated to its creating jobs. I mean, no, that's right. That's rising tide. That's rising tide. Development, starting small businesses, and so forth. So, and they're supposed to serve again using the HUD allocation formula, using the HUD income measurements, right? When I check, when we check, we monitor the programs. We're going to say, are you serving a low to moderate income person? And if they fit into that criteria, and in theory, and says for our reports and for our sense of reporting, it does. Rising tide to speak to them, right? Can no. can they come speak to us? Because you really want to. He wants to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to see how like you know how effective they take how low low yeah. income folks. And I would suggest meeting with them and right. yeah, discuss. Yeah. I mean, we could certainly bring them into a meeting and ask them. But uh, I think they would probably view the idea that uh, an entrepreneur, low income entrepreneur, is um, while they may not be um, uh, creating multiple jobs, 10, 15 jobs, that that person is creating um, their own business and, and uh, ability to sustain themselves on a personal basis. Although some of them also create multiple right. jobs as well, right? So. Um, yes. Going back to something, 40, 46 Jones Street, Fiasco. I thought Charles O'Day and the county and everybody were gonna encourage rent, uh, renters to try to get rental insurance on their apartments. What happened to that, Do you know? So with the Jones Street, I don't think it was a fiasco. Um, um, I, so my office is engaged in that, so I have to defend my office. So I, I gave you, I, all fairness councilman, I don't think it was a fiasco because it ha the fire happened over the weekend on Tuesday, when the, over the holiday, Memorial Day weekend, they were in my office. We, my, my office was in there and engaging. So to answer your question in regards to looking into whether or not we can enforce um, insurance to individuals, Encourage it. That's something that's up in the law department right now. We're reviewing it. I do have an in-house compliance manager that's looking into some of those things, but we are looking into creating a more robust relocation policy given our, our guidelines. So I don't have an answer for you yet, but as soon as it gets reviewed by legal, whether or not we can enforce homeowners, um, or sorry, rentals insurance, um, that's not something that I can answer. When I, when I called a fiasco, you weren't, the first two or three days was unbelievable what went on. And, uh, you know, uh, I'll be honest with you, thank God the county stepped in and put a lot of the help. Because the county was really good. Uh, Bill O'Day, not Charles O'Day. Bill O'Day was uh, very good. Charles O'Day was very good also. But something has to be done when we don't go through that again. I understand that um, the county um, and the city have been working collaboratively for a very long time. A former employee of the city of my office, Jonique Mosley, works at the county, and she is, knows the city's process because she was, has been a part of it. And my office now, my Angel Russo, you know, Salad Diaz, all part of the relocation team, we have, have, are on top of it. Uh, unfortunately, it goes back to Councilman Hughes' position. There's not enough funding, right? And how do I anticipate the next fire and what we set aside our funding for? It? And we're very clear in regards to what we can assist and help in. You're right, $100,000 for the, this being the only lead funding agency outside of the Red Cross and partial, you know, um, stipends that other organizations may give is not a proper strategy, and we are looking into that. Yeah, always she, that they should mention the funding. So we amended the, our budget is every month, every year, transfer dollar from A to B. Why don't we at least funding for $100,000, you know? We can't, you know, the budget of the dollar, we can't do any transfers until the end of the year. So it can't do anything right now. Do Nothing, the law prevents it. Colin, yeah. sorry. Okay. <laughs> All right, any other questions for Carmen? No. All right, thank you, Carmen. 10N. Oh, 10N, I'm sorry. 20 day waiver for Garden State Episcopal. 10N is a. 20 days for City Ordinance 17096, which is. Well. Okay, she's deferring to the law department on that. Yep. Yes. Please, would you call Paul up at St. Joseph's Home of the Blind uh, and the Cusack Center, they call it that. Please. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Director Stamato. Z7 is, is authorizing an award of contract to advanced furnace and air duct cleaning for the cleaning of sanitation of the ductwork and air handlers at the Jersey City Municipal Court. That's correct. Uh, this has never been done. We ran into, we had received a, a phone call or complaint actually as far as the air ventilation system and upon discovery uh, we realized that uh, we came to realize that the duct systems were basically needed cleaning Any questions for the duct on this? My, my question is uh, have we checked other buildings then we're in the process we're in the process of doing that um, it's a slow operation but yes we are Ten Z eight. Open end contract to M J Hogue Contracting Incorporated for tree planting citywide. That's correct. As you can see, last year we spent seventy five thousand dollars. We're upping that to one hundred eight thousand. Our goal is to naturally plant a lot more trees than what we did last year. And there, uh, I get to find one call from the one of the neighbors. Actually, they pay like a $200 this, this springtime, and they complain they're not planting the trees till today. So this one will solve the problem, right? That's correct. Okay, good. Now, this is in um, coordination with the whole you know, like the tree effort. Um, tree I forget the term, but actually, well, yes. It's, uh, this, is the, this is the initiative that was put in place to do the shade trees to increase the percentage of uh, the canopy cover for the city of Jersey City. So they put tree they charge $6. How much cost for a tree, how much for plant of trees, if we separate? I can give you that information. I don't have it with me today. And uh, as you know, like a Central Avenue and the some part of the Jersey City Main Street need the ginkgo tree. And the based on trees, they're different price. You know what I'm saying? So now we're going to have $108,000 and the, can I have a list of that, you know, uh, what kind of trees we're going to purchase? I'm leaving that up to the, I'm leaving that up to the arborist. Um, we, there, is a, there is a problem with uh, the types of trees that have been painting, planted in the past due to this particular fungus or whatever that's coming into our area. Um, but, but I know in your area there were roughly about four to five trees that need planting. I received a list from the, the commercial group. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is just for the actual planting of the trees, not for the trees. The trees itself is out to bid again. So this is not the trees. This is the whole. This is the labor for the trees. The installation. The installation of the trees. Just the installation of the trees. So plant to each tree costs three hundred sixty dollars. A lot of money. No, really. I thought that's why I asked that $306 include trees. It's not. No, just no, installation. That was, that was separate. Wow. Is there a number on what the cost is per tree or what the number of trees? Um, I think it's 360. I guess it is 360. It is 360, yes. It was advertised in bid. That's correct. It was. Yes. This is the lowest bidder. Okay. All right. 10Z9. Contract with Starlight Electric for sports lighting and scoreboard maintenance at ball fields. That's correct. Last year, our, our, uh, we spent roughly $93,000 in 2016. This year, we're looking at $158,000. 
And the main reason for that is because of um, Berry Lane Park coming online. Two thousand sixteen, we spent ninety-three thousand dollars. Two thousand seventeen, we one hundred fifty-eight thousand. So, in other words, price increases seventy percent. So, my next question is that: How many billboards I have to set up spot uh, the lighting in the uh, park of Mary? What's, um, what's the name of the park? Berry Lane. Lane Park. How many do they have there? There is an extensive list in, um, in this contract. What I can get you is the exact number at Berry Lane. I'll be more than happy to forward that over to you. They're going to put you 12 apart. But I'd like to know total how many. It's a very, how many actually uh, it's a lighting system we have to put in that uh, Berry Park. Because 70% increase, we're all going to scratch your head, you know? I agree. Remember, this isn't like we're going to spend this number. I mean, we're, we're basically looking to go up to that number. So it could be a lot less due to the fact that this park is coming online as long as somebody doesn't break the light bulbs. I mean, giving, I'm just giving you an example. But we need to put this aside so that if we need to go up to that, you know, we have the ability to do so. So it's not just, it does not like to know. Scoreboard, how many we have there, okay? I will definitely and the, those based on each part. Instead of just get total, bearing pocket, so many, person field, so many, you know what I'm saying? All right? Yes. All right. It's not light. Person field has one. Okay, on to 10, Jewel Electric Supply Company for electrical equipment and supplies under state contract. Z10. Z10. DGW spent roughly $40,000 last year just on light bulbs alone for the different ball fields, electrical systems, and so on for the different parks in the area, along with a lot of the municipal buildings. Any questions on Z10? No. Oh, what's your next item? Z11. And that would be a contract to emergency equipment sales for various parts and repair to fire truck 76308. There's a need to repair, as it states, fire truck number 70, 76308. Uh, this is for a fifth wheel, wheel assembly, pivot pin, and the vendor is the official Seagrave dealer. So we're forced to go back to that dealer due to the fact of the, the, the not so much the warranty, but um, what's the term I'm looking to use? Um, proprietary, the, basis. The, the proprietary basis. Proprietary basis. And you're looking at $36,699. $36,600 and 99 cents. Any questions? Do you need any items? That's it. Sir. Yes, sir. I know uh, over the last week or so, by text, we even had extensive conversation on just um, the signage. And so, is there a way where we can uh, I guess start purchasing the pedestrian? Uh, signage, because I know the problem is that it's knocked over, you have to replace it, you have to fix it, and stuff like that. But after all the stuff that's been going on with um, people, individuals dying, being killed, uh, folks really are looking for signage. Like, folks looking for stuff to be replaced. Like, I'm getting calls like every day on just making sure that it's out there. And so, we uh, please, over the next week or so, whatever, start uh, just purchasing. Just a necessary signage to be placed back along the like west side. Are you out of signage? Well, huh? You're out of signage? We're not out of signage. What the problem is, is the fastest we put it in, so you have vehicles that are basically running over the signage, especially the pedestrian uh, crossing signage. So right now what we're doing is where we are replacing the signage, but we're looking for alternate methods, different types of signage that we can put up, not in the roadway, but off to the side of the road. Naturally, it's not going to be as effective as putting the signage in the road, but people basically are using them as target. They cost two hundred fifty dollars a piece, and cost the half of them are broken and knocked in. Well, what we're finding is you, not only cars; you have trucks that are hitting them. So we're we're we are we're working on it, and we will put the signage back. But I want the council to realize that, you know, it is two hundred and fifty dollars. And once it goes, gets run over by a car or a truck, there's not much left. We can do that. We're looking at that. I had sent over to Joe Cunha 
something that was done in another another country, I think, uh, where they colored the crosswalks yeah. different colors. It, like really stands out, and like uh, um, I was told they were looking into that. I don't know if they are really exploring that or not. Or? I don't know whether we would have to go work jointly with the legal department in order to have like an ordinance or DOT or whatever, but we are looking into that, believe me. I mean, the only thing I see us doing right now is basically to put the signage back that they're using for target practice and try to, try to deal with it the best we can until we can get something, whether it's um, coloring the crosswalk walks with some type of uh, paint or what have you, or a different type of signage that would be off to the side. It's not going to be as effective as the sign in the middle of the road, but then again, you know, it is $250 for somebody to hit it, and they are hitting them. And I'll reach out to Joe and everyone so we can do like a little walk through the sure. and stuff like that during this week or so. That's no problem. Just to look at, you know, like, like temporary basis. Not the permit is where we violate state statute or whatever, but just something that could calm the traffic and flow at different. We, have, we really have to do something. Though, yeah. And I agree with what you said, Gelsman, earlier about the, the problem that we're having with the vehicles, with the pedestrians. Uh, it's, you know, it's totally ridiculous. But uh, we need to sit down, like you said, and I'm sure with uh, engineering and DPW, we'll work something out. And naturally, legal. Yeah. Well, Joe Cunha knows the regulations, so like, he'll be able to know what, what, can, what we can do and what we can't. Okay. Any other questions? Actually, you have one other item. I, it's not on your list, but 10V. I'm sorry. Yes, I missed that. So this is V is... Authorizing the purchasing agent to sell various impounded motor vehicles at public auction. Oh. Anyone want to buy an 89? So, I mean, we've seen this multiple times before. Um, I mean, it's the same, same, none of these vehicles are going to actually like, be bought at auction, right? Because they're way, the minimum bids are too high. Correct. What we're trying to do is, we're, and as you know, we're playing catch up. Uh, we did have a, uh, an, an auction just, what, a month ago. We're trying to get up to the point where every month we're having auction, auctions for vehicles. Um, go ahead. My, my request is that rather than trying to catch up, that you, you take the, the, the vehicles that are already ready to be auctioned and they're still viable and as, as auctionable cars, I guess. Um, so if they're 90 days, I understand that. And, and I'm not an expert in this, but after 20 days, you could actually auction. But maybe after 90 days, um, based on the storage fees, after 90 days, could auction those vehicles. Because you're going to be catching up forever, and they're just never going to catch up. And so nobody makes out, as I understand it, with this. Uh, it goes out for minimum bids. Correct. Um, you don't get the minimum bids. We've spent money and time doing the minimum bids, trying to get the, uh, the title and all that other stuff. And then when, um, when the... When you don't get the minimum bids, then you basically just give it back to the uh, car pound to, uh, for them to be able to sell it for scrap. Right. And they make uh, some a minimum amount of money on that. And we make no money on it, where we'd make some money on the auction of the actual vehicle if there was some money coming back to us. Um, I mean, I, I don't know what the numbers would look like in terms of actual dollars to us. Um, but all I know is we're losing money <laughs> in the, in the right. other process, right? So we, it's uh, right now we did, we're, we're actually um, legals handling uh, the bid forms, correct? Yeah, I, I can Go ahead. Some of that. We've been working on the bid specs for quite a while to uh, get the correct contract in place. The bid spec is basically ready to go for the vehicle impound locations. So for, right. So Right, because what's happening now is currently they're charging thirty dollars a day for storage. It's supposed to be three dollars a day. That's, that's not the problem. So, so right? the well, it, they, they, they don't go out to bid, and they're not they're not moving it. They're not moving the inventory well, out there. Well, they're moving it faster. The state is the issue with that. You know, you have to send them a money order for each vehicle. You have to wait for them to provide back the title. We so that, don't that's, quicker. We have another resolution. On I, I would like evidence of that because the information I'm getting is that it's not moving, right. and that it's just. That the requests for tra tra for titles are not being happening on a regular basis, and that um, we're just piling up inventory. And it's, right. uh, um, I mean, I would su suggest going out to like get a consultant to just uh, yeah. 
do this stuff to get the titles and so forth. And yeah, um, if that's going to expedite uh, this whole process. Right now, what I want to do is this: I'm in the process of contacting the state to try to speed their end up. Um, if I need assistance, I'll come back to the council. But in the meantime, I do have a I do have a meeting that will be probably set up within the next week or so with the state, where I'll go down and uh, basically sit with them on that. I like the idea about possibly going ahead with a consultant, all right, to look at overall, look at the system, see where we're deficient, and see how we can improve on that. On our side. On that, this would be a consultant on our side to basically either revamp the system or, um, you know, to modify it some way to, to move the inventory, because we are losing a lot of money. We should reopen the police town that we had before. We never had these problems before, and they made money. But once again, with the prior administration, they gave away the police town, and it was a shame. Well, here again, I mean, that's something that we can look at. Uh, I would base that, I would go back to the, have, here again, if we were in a position to uh, have a consultant come on and look at that and do an evaluation that I could present it to the council to move forward on it. I would not have a problem doing that. But we need to correct it, and I agree with you, Council President, that uh, it's not moving rapidly enough and it's costing the city a tremendous amount of money. Any other questions? Any other items? No? Thank you, gentlemen. Go on, me, beat me. <laughs> He's here in, uh, on behalf of Andrew Vichio. And you want to start with your resolutions or ordinances? Uh, we'll start with your ordinances. Yep. Speaking on behalf of uh, Andrew Vichio, engineering and traffic. Related ordinances. Yeah. Prohibiting the right turn on red signal at the intersections of Summit Avenue and Magnolia at all times, at all approaches, all times. Oh, the, okay. Didn't make sense to me for a moment, but. Yeah, this is at the request of Councilman Bogiano. This is at the request of numerous people. Yes. These cars come shooting around. A couple of people almost got hit by cars, and they want it. Yeah, we heard this from quite a few residents. Yeah. I think there was also a C-click fix um, stating this, but it, it is basically the high pedestrian volumes in the area that uh, kind of make this a good idea. Okay, 3C. That is a, an ordinance amending the traffic code, stop intersections, stop. designating Liberty Avenue and St. Paul's Avenue as a multi-way stop intersection. <coughs> okay, any questions on this? No. It's very straightforward, right? Yeah. All right. Agreed. Agreed. 3D. Loving it. An ordinance amending the traffic code. Stop intersections designating both Martorano Way and Carbon Place and Martorano Way and Fisk Street as a stop intersection. Any questions on this? Is in Ward B, I think. Uh, yeah. Or Ward A, is it? Yeah. It's B. I, I, I think I got for that area like a request to, is it two ways over there? Yeah. Or is it one way? Yeah. When you go down and they go into the U turn, you U -turn. turn back on Carbon. So you can either access it from Carbon or the other way. Yeah. But they like to speed around. Yeah. Yeah. Could I ask a question? Because I know you sent me some information about the uh, handicap ordinance, but I didn't see them in the past. Are we going to introduce them? This was an ordinance sent to my office for the next meeting. And I got a visit from Judy, Judy Ryder. Yeah. Judy she Ryder. wanted this on the agenda. Yeah. All right. Okay. I just need to get right. the original ordinance. Okay. I don't know where the original ordinance is in the. And, and we, got, we got a call, call this morning, uh, right before I, I left the office, and Patty Logan was not there um, today. And 
I think we are going to work on that tomorrow. Um, and and Patty will get you whatever you need because I, I don't know exactly where she keeps all the hard copies. It has only nine <laughs> names on it. Nine addresses. Huh? They're all approved by the committee. Yeah, it's one net, so that's why. Yeah. It's two lists, I think. That's why I want to make sure. Well, there's okay. one on for second reading. Yeah. Yep. We have they one. They sent on. over two. I got two in my pack in the mail, and I didn't see. Them. So we'll wait till Patty comes tomorrow and okay. just make sure he gets it. You got okay. it. I mean, there might be one besides this yeah, or this thing. Another another address. No. The location? Another audience might be a So when Pat comes, she'll go straight Yeah, they should have put them all. Okay. Okay. Let's go to 3E. Okay. Uh, 3E is an ordinance amending the no parking prohibition on the east side of Garfield Avenue, adjacent to Berry Lane Park. And section 332-31, parking restrictions for street cleaning purposes, designating parking restrictions for street cleaning purposes on the east side of Garfield Avenue, adjacent to Liberty to Berry Lane Park, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Councilman, did you have something to say? No. Uh, good with it? We've been for this for a couple months. Okay. We've had some abandoned vehicles sitting there in front of Berry Lane Park for a long time. Yeah. Once we curved and then and we weren't right. We wasn't sweeping. So they found out that that was one of the locations that we wasn't sweeping. So we had some abandoned vehicles. So thanks. Take care of that. Great. All right. Some second reading ordinances he's here for as well. In case there's any additional questions, that includes. Uh, 4E, 4G, what is 4F, 4G, and 4H. If there are any questions regarding that, they're all fairly routine. Council members, I know we didn't get to resolutions yet, but the two, resol two resolutions that were withdrawn from the last meeting for Loading zones were put back on the agenda. Those are 10, what, OMP? Uh, yeah, let's find them. Well, I put them in amongst yes, 10 the I, 10 B. Yeah, I put them in amongst the other traffic related resolutions. So if we want to go to 10 O, that's uh, loading zone 30 foot in front of 994 West side avenue <coughs> monday through saturday 10 a.m to 8 p.m i think that was taken off as a courtesy to you in your absence councilman gadsden yeah so let's so what's that? okay <laughs> council president yes 10 at the full eye what? full eye second four reading I. yes okay, Four eyes? Yes. And the law department also. PA? <coughs> I had a meeting with a. It's an amazing, right? Yeah. We're still on the yeah, we're on, we're oh, on oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. We're in one theme. Yeah. Traffic theme. <coughs> okay, any questions on 10 O or 10 P, which are loading zones? One's at uh, West Side Avenue, 994 West Side. The other is on Palisade Avenue. We're we'll going to have a... Let, let okay. Councilman Gaston on 10 first. Please. Okay. Yep. Councilman Gaston? No, no problem. Nothing. The supermarket. All right. Michael, what's your name? 10P? Yeah, 10 p We're going to have a meeting uh, this afternoon, I guess, 6 o'clock, regarding to discuss with the community and uh, there's two owners, okay? So we'll let you know. That's Wednesday. A more, that's a more seat, right? Yeah. Yeah. More seat. Yeah. Oh, more seat. You going to come in? All right, thank you. Okay, now to the <coughs> street closures. <laughs> oh, okay. we need, do we need to discuss that with them? Oh, okay. Yeah, we're good. And we only have we only have one. Okay. okay it's uh, two. Two. I'm sorry. Q and R. Q and R. Q and R. 
Any question on Q&R? Nope, they're both mine. Nope. Olivia Bray. All right, 10Q, 10R. They're crossed out. Next. Okay, um, before we go to the presentation, I'm JC from JC Builds. Um, I, we have um, representatives here with regard to four, which is it, four uh, G J? No, four A. Four A. I'm sorry. This has to do with uh, the ordinance vacating a portion of Freeman Avenue and Field Avenue. <laughs> Members of the council, this is four A. This is uh, speak now or forever hold your peace. Any questions on 4A? So, What's that? Uh, the gentleman is. We have representatives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Ron Chowton here. He was asked to be here. Uh, Any questions? Counselor, make so, your make your case. Meeting, right? I wasn't here. Okay, you want to hear what it's about? It's, just, it's like a thirty seconds. Mm -hmm. Give her a thirty second brief on what the. Uh, okay. I mean, I read it, but just, just right. kind of like to hear your thirty second <laughs> perspective. I represent uh, St. George's and St. Shenouda Coptic Church. That's not a PA, so you're, you're just okay. Just and. Um, we are under contract to purchase uh, the properties that are shown on the, uh, on the map that's attached to the ordinance. Uh, we have an application pending before the planning board to uh, build a campus for the church to house a new church and a community center at that location. Uh, it is anticipated that the uh, the relocation of a portion of the services to the SIP Avenue location is going to alleviate a lot of the pressure that presently exists at the present location on Bergen Avenue. There's a lot of traffic congestion, parking, um, and and by uh, by permitting us to proceed and by permitting us to vacate these streets and include these streets into the campus. Uh, we're going to have a, a, an overall, a, a very beautiful uh, gateway project coming into Jersey City on SIP Avenue. I've tried to be as brief as possible. Any questions? It's a, it's a beautiful project. You have an opportunity to look at the renderings if you haven't. Worth uh, taking a look at. Let me ask one of you. So, Blug 11801, and the Blug is 11802, is owned by one entity. Under contract to be acquired by the church. This is not contract yet. Yes, there is. They're so under contract. We haven't closed yet. Yeah, right. But let's make sure the plug 1801 and the plug is a 1182 both is all will be owned yeah. by church. Okay. <clears throat> but I think my question is that when I look at the map, it's the first place. Why they build up the street in this? Behind is a uh, cemetery, right? right. I can't answer that one. I mean, really, it's a common sense. Of why they build and up the street, which is go nowhere? And right now, it's, it's full of junk and debris and and garbage and. Uh, and it's only not even block. Maybe one quarter of the block. It's the spirit. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Comments? <clears throat> Thank you. I'm sorry you had to wait so long. But, uh, Thank you. Thank you, Father. Okay, now we have uh, representatives here from uh, the mayor's office and the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. They're here to speak about uh, JC Builds. I guess you lost um, the JCRA along the way. Is that they're gone?
My name is Soraya Hebron, and um, I'm representing the mayor's office. So I'm here to um, make you guys aware of a new pilot program that the city, JCRA, Community Development, Office of Diversity and Inclusion, uh, we've all been working together to come up with this program, um, and we plan to officially launch it next week. Um, so I'm going to go through the slides. You can ask questions at the end, or I can go back, you know, and refer to anything. And I also have, one second, copies for you guys. You can follow along take notes or anything. So this is basically a pilot program to create affordable housing and jobs um, in Jersey City. So the mission statement is to empower local nonprofit organizations to create affordable housing and jobs in underinvested Jersey City neighborhoods. The problem is lack of affordable housing. You know that there's an uh, excess, not a grand excess, but there are there are uh, properties that the city owns, and we're trying to think of ways to use these more effectively. Um, and even though unemployment in Jersey City is at um, a respectable rate compared to other cities in the state, um, it's disproportionate to minorities. Um, so currently, these are the strategies that the city uses to fit, address these problems. We have the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, um, the tiered pilot program, which you guys are all familiar with the APRA Act um, and Home Investment Partnership. So um, I'm not sure um, what everyone knows about affordable housing, but these are just some numbers to give you some context for Jersey City. Um, currently, we have 1,516 affordable units, um, and this breaks it down to what's completed and what's under construction. Um, and the numbers on the side, they tell you specifically what is designated for um, seniors, veterans, and special needs residents. So um, this project, we're hoping to create affordable housing that would be designated for this vulnerable population. Where are these steps? These numbers are from the open data portal um, that's on our website that Office of Innovation um, updates frequently. So th these are the most um, updated numbers. Um, and also, this is a screenshot from the open data portal um, map that's currently up on the city's website. So as you can see, just to give you a visualization, the um, yellow is under construction, blue is what's completed, and the larger the, the circle is, that's um, more units are in that property. So if you're looking at... Is this the same as the Avenue? I believe so, yeah, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just to zoom in a little bit at what we'll be focusing on, we want to focus on the underinvested areas of Jersey City. So it's mainly Ward F and parts of Ward A. Um, and these, all these small, small dots, they are um, like two family or two unit properties. So we're trying to increase and address that specific pool. So we're trying to fill the gaps um, with those smaller unit number properties. Um, so our solution with JC Builds is to fill the gaps in the lower unit count projects, create jobs for local minorities, and allow nonprofits to be stakeholders in the process. So the model, using the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, JCRA will apply to Affordable Housing Trust Fund for funds for the program, um, and we expect about $800,000 to $1 million award. Um, JCRA will then give the nonprofits um, a property, and they will also give them up to $250,000 to develop it. Like I said, Ward, a focus, Ward F focus, excuse me, and um, as of now, all of the properties that we've um, that we have to choose from are vacant lots. So they would be it wouldn't be a um, redevelopment. It would just be from the ground up. So qualifying applicants have to have had um, served Jersey City for at least five years, have an annual budget of at least seven hundred fifty thousand. I'm gonna um, speak on that a little bit more on the next slide. Are in good standing with all state and city agencies and must have filed an I nine ninety uh, for the previous tax year. Um, so we know that not a lot of nonprofits have a budget of seven hundred fifty thousand dollars or more. But can I can I save the question till the end? Or do you want to? Yeah, I just want to know what having started the city in five years. What does that mean? The nonprofit organization that's involved with uh, developing affordable housing, right? Well, they don't have to specifically be focused on developing affordable housing, but they have to serve Jersey City residents for you know at least five years. Yes, yeah. yeah, so you can't just yeah like come in and be a new nonprofit. We want people that have been contributing to our yes. Um, so 
um, organizations that do have a budget less than this can partner with a private community-minded organization, a local developer, or a larger nonprofit. Um, we want to make sure that these organizations have the capacity to handle money and to you know, um, follow through with the project. Um, partnership is attractive for local developers because it gives them free good publicity because they're contributing to you know, um, affordable housing and the city. And it also gives their junior members experience to go through the permit process. What's the minimum? <coughs> you got $750,000 left. Yeah, but what's, what's the minimum? What's the starting point? The minimum, we haven't discussed it yet. So. For a nonprofit to be able to, or some organization. Have an annual budget. And if not, you have to have a fiscal sponsor that at least has that. So a person may have 250000 Unless they have a fiscal sponsor that partners with them. Yes. So how many agencies currently meet that threshold, would you say? Right. Urban League, Paco, who else? Who Garden State Episcopal. So there are organizations, and we've discussed this internally, there are organizations that would meet that criteria, um, and then the smaller local ones can reach out to those larger ones or other private companies to partner. What guarantee would we have that they would partner with the smaller organizations? Because I know that's always a problem when people partner. I mean, even we had a situation, I never forget, with a, uh, a nonprofit organization. She needed just to get finances. She wanted to just partner with another organization, and nobody would partner with her. Mm -hmm. And she had a good program. So, so we, how do we? Oh. And this number, we've discussed moving this number up or down, but we want to make sure that we have it at a mark where we're sure that the nonprofit that you know applies will be able to handle this project. So that number is you know, a little flexible, but we want to make sure that we're not going to give them the funding and they don't have the capacity to handle, you know, the project. So we can revisit that. Mm -hmm. To adjust that, to adjust that number. Is the little guy still going to get hurt? Well, we, and also in the, the terms of the agreement, we want to make sure that the local um, nonprofit, well, I guess if it's two nonprofits, we want to make sure that they will um, benefit in the end because when they sell, they will get to keep the you know the um, revenue, so we want to make sure that that would be fair in the, the partnership. Yeah, uh, so I was just trying to get the, the, the questions the until the end. Oh, I'm can. sorry, because I can, no problem. I'm just kidding. Yeah, 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 I don't want to keep I'm just anyone trying to see how they So evaluation criteria: there will be a committee which will be made up of a representative from each of the departments um, in the JC Build Committee. So that's community development, diversity, and inclusion, um, JCRA, the mayor's office, and city council. And we also have a community member on the um, application review committee. Um, these are the criteria. You can look at it um, later. But these are the criteria that we'll be using to evaluate applicants. Um, the developers must enter into an RDA with JCRA. We're suggesting two to three family um, homes. Um, they must hire, this is important, qualified Jersey City resident minority and women workers. So we'll be using um, a list that Office of Diversity and Inclusion has compiled of minority contractors um, that we will give to the developers. So they must use that list to the best of their abilities to um, you know, staff these projects. And it's recommended that they to sell. To the best of their abilities, it sounds close to good faith. Right. But it will be in the it will be in the terms of their RDA. They have to hire minorities. Great. They have to. <laughs> um, and we're recommending that they sell um, the property um, once they've re redeveloped it, um, and they will be able to keep um, you know the profit from that. And once they sell it with the affordability controls, they're going to have a huge profit margin, and that will go to the nonprofit. So here's our timeline. Um, yeah, once, once they, because we're giving them the money to develop, so, you know, they're going to keep all of the, the revenue, so. So they're not bringing any money to the table? Well, if they the can do it with up to $250,000, and that's why we want, we need nonprofits that have, you know, the money to supplement that. Um, so we're trying to, to make it open to both. Um, but they can bring more, but we will give them up to $250,000, but they will keep all of the revenue. From the development, the nonprofit. So this is our timeline. Our 
ideal timeline is to um, release the RFQ next week. Um, we'll have an information session in, at City Hall, and then a second one, if based on the, the turnout, you know, um, at the first one. If we need to, we'll have a second one in the community outside of City Hall. Application deadline 31st. Uh, um, September 30th, the review period will end and hopefully announced by October 20th. Yes. Yeah, so time for like advertisement and uh, correct because that that's short. Yeah, it is. It's too short. That's that's short. And, and, and you have people with a, because you're not going to get no. You're not going to get a lot of people. Whatever. Um, yeah. Everybody's on vacation. It should really start in September. Start and this is not everybody, but yeah. 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 folks. What are the time? Oh. Is someone going to speak on this? Carmen, where are you? Okay. Two roads. No, no, no. I have a question. Wait, let me, there was a question was asked as to whether or not the timeline could be amended. There. Is that something you need to go back to discuss with your folks, or is that not? The timeline had been pushed back. It was supposed to be moving forward, but because there were certain things that were going on, uh, Jeremy met with us. It should have been earlier in this presentation, but because he wanted to roll it out by September, that those are the deadlines that we were given, really. But the public won't yeah. be of what could I understand that. They won't. Yeah, this is vacation time. So, so this is what happens. I, I come, I present to you, and I bring this back to Jeremy and the committee and let them know that this is what how council feels, and then we, you know, we make adjustments. So yeah, just to... <laughs> So these nonprofits, is, is there a particular type of nonprofit or any nonprofit? Let me give an example. Um, so let's say Art House Productions has, I don't know how much their budget is. Let's say it's $500,000 a year. I have no idea. And so they partner with KRE, because KRE <laughs> says, oh, okay, I want to help right. them out, or Silverman Brothers, or some developer. Like someone like that, like an arts nonprofit could Well, could they are an arts nonprofit and they want to get yeah. into affordable housing and build affordable housing. I mean, it. it what? If they're a nonprofit, because I'm trying to understand. That's what I'm trying to understand. So why would our house though want to do this profit? project? If they want to do it because they want to take the revenue, the same as any of the other nonprofits. With your, with your mission though, you know, then you can. Well, it, because it's. I mean, the way I'm looking at it is that a nonprofit, somebody, a nonprofit comes in, right? And you could say arts group, you could say fill in the blank, any nonprofit. It doesn't really matter. If they're serving Jersey City residents, that the way they're going to look at it is here's free money to develop something that gives affordable housing to people. So check, I did a good thing in the affordable housing checkbox. And also I keep the revenue stream so I can do my program, mm -hmm. which may not be development. It might be something else. I'm just trying to understand yeah. who, who is the, the, the nonprofit because it's not specified. So I don't understand like what makes it a nonprofit, an ideal nonprofit versus a non-ideal nonprofit. And when we evaluate the applications, this is one of the criteria that we're looking at experience with similar projects. Okay. So if you have a nonprofit that has done other projects, yeah. you know, before, then we'll rank them higher than someone okay. who, you know, appears to be just, you know, doing it for that benefit. I just want to get to the last two slides really quick and then open it up for questions. So in conclusion, these are the incentives for applicants. They get up to $250,000 of funding for a redevelopment project, land for a nominal fee, um, an opportunity to get um, mentorship from a local developer, and you know they get to um, keep the revenue from the sale with the affordability controls. Um, the city in the local developer is a profit or not profit local developer? Profit. So they can partner with a profit, KRA. So if, go back to the no, well, the, no, for the opportunity for local developer mentoring, if you are, if you feel like you need mentorship or advice, there are um, local developers that we are reaching out to that will help advise oh, wow. these nonprofits. Yes, if they, if they need it, that would advise, yes. And then, um, 
So for, for the city, the incentives were filling, like I said, that unique gap of the two, the low count um, afford, affordable housing for this specific, um, uh, sorry, this specific demographic, senior special needs and individuals transitioning out of foster care and the homeless, this is what we want to target these projects toward. And then creating um, jobs for minority contractors, approximately up to 10 per project, let's say. So these are our goals for the first cycle. Where you do four, four properties, approximately eight to 12 units, and creating approximately 40 minority jobs. And this is a pilot program, so we want to you know, run this the first time and see how it goes and hopefully, you know, grow from there. Carmen. Just to give, um, I guess, uh, support you all agree with this, or I just want to know that the funding is coming out of the affordable housing trust. That's where it's coming. That's what I want to know. Yeah, okay. You were out with it. She all out. right. <laughs> so understand that the affordable housing trust fund will review all applicants that apply. So JCRA will be applying to the city for affordable housing trust fund dollars to pilot this program. In that, you understand we have a committee review, so there'll be that first layer yeah. review where it's eligibility threshold. Um, and, and identifying how this pilot is going to work. Um, I think number two, I think what needs to be set aside is that uh, JCRA is in here, but the properties I think that are being identified will not have the say CDG or home funding. So it's much different than kind of sort of what happens in my space when we're mm -hmm. being a grant maker and producing and doing some things related to affordable housing. So um, when um, some of the changes, and I can say some of the challenges that we've had in community development is um, CHOTOs, right? And being mm -hmm. developed in CHOTOs and those that are nonprofits and we're de developing and doing something similar, what they're trying to do is pilot something in the affordable housing trust fund that isn't so regulated with CPD funding mm -hmm. to try to see if this concept will work. So mm -hmm. in 2013, the home rules changed right. for CHOTOs. Right now in the city, right now in the office, I have one CHOTO in, in, um, right. um, in the city. So I think that there is going to be the authority of committee that is also going to be part of this review. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund Review Committee will review the proposal and make sure that Jay's already has applied for significant and for the eight fifty to $2 million, it's like four projects that we're kind of, sort of hoping to designate and in regards to getting the steps identified. And so I think this is, a, 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 again, a brainstorming pilot idea to see if we can help create more affordable housing. Mm -hmm. Understanding that we're not trying to sort of navigate the CDBG rules, right. but there are CDBG rules and requirements that, you know, and just trying to get things from A to Z, uh, such as our growth and developing of affordable housing. So there's certain rules they would have to follow because of the affordable trust fund that we got. Correct. So they, right. they will be following this, the, sure, yeah. the stuff that's enforced by the committee and some of these that we review, and then we present to council um, in, in the next funding cycle. So the applications for I need from the trust fund will go out at the end of August, mm -hmm. and then we'll go through that cycle, and the committee will be a lot kind of sort of along with the, the schedule that was met here. They made some tweaks to that as directing back to the committee so that we're in the same timeline frame, but mm -hmm. they're being here, and the members are member not here um, to discuss. And so, do, do affordable housing trust fund grantees prescribe to the same um, requirements as a CDBG funded applicant as far as housing development and so I would say that um, historically the let's say the home application and the affordable housing trust fund application didn't mirror each other. Mm -hmm. What I did last year and the year prior is we actually had the consolidated RFP um, for the affordable housing trust fund that didn't exist before. So with this application that I'm not the only person grant making or writing the RFP, I haven't seen it yet, but that's a meeting that we'll have. But um, affordable housing trust fund does mirror home um, in, in, in its requirements. It's not strictly to homes, rules, and rights that can't afford something that necessary that isn't the ordinance for the affordable housing trust fund. Okay. Candace, you have any questions? Anyone else? I have a question. Yes. Um, like maybe something uh, that will assist this effort is something um, maybe the city or the committee should look into, like community uh, land trust, because it sounds like. You're going to take the pre-existing stock of land that's in the JCRA. You want to ensure that affordable housing, whatever is done, um, I guess continually with the project. But there are like models out there. Um, I just came across something, whatever, just last month about what folks are doing in New York with the Blasio and folks mm -hmm. are doing, and they're making sure that affordable housing is sustainable for the life of the project, like in perpetuity, like. 
it's sold, it's passed down for like years. And so, whereas this right here is kind of like loose in its, um, I guess the structure of it, but maybe um, a little bit more analysis of community land trust and having, you know, non-profits, you know, commit to those type of things would be a good thing. My concern is the partnership. Um, because I know not all nonprofits have 750000 To me, that is a problem. And I can't see large nonprofit organization developers partner with them. It seems like we're going to have, uh, they're going to want to come in and take over. I thought our whole objective was to help the little guy. So, uh, you know, how are we going to, yeah, that doesn't make, make any sense do, to me. I'm, I'm having a problem another, digesting another, that. Because um, the big guys like to rule. So the little guys, I know. That was was lowering the requirement but then pointing these local nonprofits to other revenue streams to other funding sources um, but then that also you know slows down the process threshold is to ensure this capacity of the, the organization yes. to be able to um, build and construct the, the pro project. I guess what I, in, in accordance with what um, Councilman Waterman is getting at, um, if, a, if a smaller nonprofit is looking to get into the de development business, affordable housing development business, um, or is doing it but not at that scale already, and um, what is the incentive for that bigger pro nonprofit to partner with the smaller nonprofit? particularly if they get to keep the money, like that they make off the sale, there's no incentive, right? So you have to have some sort of set aside either for like partnership programs of some sort um, that would uh, allow for them, force them to be able to partner and then be able to build capacity of smaller nonprofits to be able to get into the game and then build capacity as a city for us to have more developers of non-affordable housing. that the smaller developer would automatically get um, and then the, the larger developer would get a certain percentage. Uh, I think it's what we had talked about. Um, I just don't was any of the large developers at this table? Yeah. The only reason why I'm yeah. asking is because if you want somebody to partner with somebody and I'm the biggest mm -hmm. stockholder, I think I should be at the table to say, am I going to do it or not? And if they're not there, we're assuming all of this, we can't even push this forward because we need them to partner with the little guy. I, 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 I just don't know. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Do we have an inventory? Did we speak to anybody yet? That, that's, 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 that's. I don't think the little guy has 750,000, you know, to, to start with. I'm shocked. I don't think Let's go to Councilman Robinson. Folks, Councilman Robinson, Councilman Ewing, and Rivera. I just want to make sure that the information sessions that, um, I, of course, the timeline, I think we're pushing it way too fast, but I want to make sure that, you know, we're talking about Ward F here, right? And so I want to make sure that we have an information session in Ward F. Yes, yeah, somewhere close to, to where we are. And, you know, my concerns are the same as uh, Councilwoman Waterman. Like, if I'm a big developer, what makes me really want to partner up with this small person if I could do the job myself? I mean, we have, uh, you know, Morris Canal here. I'm glad she, you know, you guys came out to exactly hear what's going on. And the other question, well, the question that I have is, they're able to sell the house. Where does the money go? And who do you sell it to? Is there restrictions on do you sell it to non-profits? Like, who are you actually selling the house to? restricted, so I'm assuming to the individual who's... You're looking for low-income folks who are going to purchase that property, right? Who qualify? So something like the Garden State that's doing that uh, 90 Virginia, uh, it would be that kind of project. Yeah. Over the four years, let's put it this way: good intention. I'm going to give you lots of credit for that. But actually, you gave us last minute and the purchase. Input to us is almost impossible. And we just see that the schedule wise is a rush too much. And uh, I'm going to add to one. I think I have the same question as Joyce Waterman and the Robbins. We have the same question. Chris, 
Over the past four years, as a council, when I look at it, a lot of small contracts involved the affordable housing units, middle of the day, they filed the bankruptcy, and they keep see, put your money, right, BA? Right? Many times we put your money, and the money disappears. Oh, right? I don't know, I don't know what you said. <laughs> against the, the JCR. With the, the loans and monies, and the end of the day, the project is to go nowhere. So, good intention. So, we need this time. Without fail, we're going to make sure. You know what I'm saying? So, give us some time. We can to look at it. You know? Yeah, the, the monitoring the clients of uh, JCRA. The, the re-RDA Danny, did you have uh, any other comments? Yeah, I was hit it on the head. I mean, you know, I'm just a little worried about, you know, and like Joy said, the, uh, the big guys coming in and, uh, and working with the little guys. And I just don't think that the little guys have 750,000 in their small nonprofit organization. Any other questions or comments? Yeah. Oh. Just to clarify, you're saying you're not the little guy coming in on a they're going to partner with somebody who's, who's got money, mm -hmm. somebody who is a for-profit person, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they could, so they can, they, can, they can partner with a developer. Yes, but if, but the if developer they... can't do it by himself, it has to start at the level of somebody who is a non-profit. Is that correct? Yes. So the little, the little people, if these larger developers want to do any of those projects, they can't unless they're partnering with somebody who's non-profit. Well, they can't apply to, to this yet. So they can't apply to, but a big developer could do a non-profit. They could do affordable housing. The big developer has money. Yeah, and if the big developer can come to with us for a tax evasion, they still can build. See, we're not concerned. I'm not I'm worried about the big, big developer. I'm worried about the little developer. The big non-profit developers, right? Yes, yeah, so they can partner they're with They're not cash rich. Let's just non -profit right. or a for profit or non-profit organization. So a big time yeah, and in the agreement, there would be a certain percentage, like Reverend McCray said, where the nonprofits would get more than the for-profit entity from the state. I just got to talk to I just got to Well, we got to um, In conclusion, thank you for listening to Stanley and listening to the presentation. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> Did you ask that already? We have a list of about seven or eight, and we've narrowed it down to four because we only want to do four for this first cycle. Like, the city owns already outright owns seven eight properties? Yes. So that's the uh, seven property. Seven, seven eight. And these are like yeah, vacant city lots. City. Oh, and, and this is um, a combination of JCRA and city owned. Okay, so that, that, that's that pretty good. Uh, is your goal is no, units. Four, oh, four, units. Sorry. When I say four properties, that's four, I guess, plots of land. And then to build two to three, you know, unit homes on them. So the pilot goes, you exhaust the number of units. It's a short lived pilot, right? Like, uh, um, in the sense that uh, unless you're building density on each vacant lot, like, uh, um, it's a short lived pilot with only seven to eight city owned units, unless we're going into the APRA. APRA list or other available properties out there. Yeah, I don't know what the. That also is, yeah, JCRA is constantly working on that list, so, you know, numbers so, are added to it. But. Yeah, so, I think the discussion of uh, nonprofits um, wanting to get, I, I, as director of community development, I, I speak, you know, with a, a lot of groups. And I will say that a lot of nonprofits do ask that question, and the one with them is how do I get into the development business? How can I build affordable housing because they, they, their heart is in the community, right? And things that we have to address in regards to the support needs housing and some of a lot of the things that are going on, I think getting down into the logistics of like budget and finance, that's gonna have to be worked out between the nonprofit and developer and, and some contract with the community. To have the money flow and where it's all being identified, I think from an overall perspective, I have I am not gonna say what nonprofits, but I've had multiple conversations with nonprofits um, in who apply for my grants ask me how to do more because one of the biggest needs that we do need is more affordable housing. And so this concept and this idea that, that started one months ago um, it is, I understand the time it makes it seem rushed and we understand some of the things, but just think about how affordable housing hasn't been built. And I hear you come to me in regards to 
land trust and some policies and some of the initiatives and ideas. There's things that we have, have piloted and things uh, policies that we're looking to create. Those things need to be adopted by. And I think if this does win in this smaller concept, right? This is a small project. And you're identifying four, um, four vacant lots and trying to see if this is successful. Oh. Not the engine. Given the requirements of what the chow is, I just presented to you my budget that I have no dollars to give for chow. Right? I'm allocating 185 thousand dollars that I'm required to do, but I have no applicants for chow to help build affordable housing. That's another year where affordable housing isn't being built or I have a nonprofit that's not doing something. And so I think the I think the back end does need to be worked out. And um, as they said, community development will be on the committee reviewing whether it's myself or Deborah Gigi, the assistant director, because. Uh, I'm the chairperson of the Affordable Housing Trust, so my Gigi, who will be helping them and, and um, identifying some of those things. But I think about the long stemming aspects of affordable housing not being built in the city, the fact that it is four, it's four lots, a concept, and, and trying to do it, it could be piloted into other other things. So, so, so wouldn't this be easier if you could say, um, okay, why don't we just uh, delegate Garden State Episcopal with the responsibility of helping to develop? Well, well, the idea is not to use any one particular um, like a person like Garden State was to divide it up so that they wouldn't have a monopoly on all of the um, sites to be developed. But uh, well, but, but, but yeah, not just use a lot. If there's four, if there's four pet projects that are being developed, right. why don't we take the four uh, top non-profits in the city and let them be responsible for doing something and seeing if it works. That, that they the criteria. Yeah, but people still have to apply, right? So there's still a procurement problem mm -hmm. that has to be identified. People still have to apply. And so I'll be able to go through the committee. I don't know if people should give out um, the, the RFP that our oh, that, 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 that 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 uh, redevelopment authority is, um, yeah, is doing. But I, I think that you have to allow anyone to apply um, and see what the outcomes are. And then I think working in regards to, again, Back prior to 2013, if you look at the previous resolutions that were adopted, there were many nonprofits in New York City that were in the development business. They caused call, me some of the aspects of my audit, where I was able to pay that to the faculty. But now shifting the affordable housing trust fund, not so heavily regulated, right? Because I have to enforce the federal rules to try to pilot something in New York City for affordable housing. Is it, you know, could we do more? Absolutely, but. What I'm saying is, say, like, for example, Garden State's focus is. Homeless, uh, sure. homelessness, and, and they already, whatever, like you already approved for funding, whatever, for homelessness, so they still fit within that scope. So say like, uh, you know, the goal is to create transitional housing, whatever, a two or three, whatever, bedroom unit for families to do this, that, and third. Why don't they just take the lead, whatever, and, and provide that type of housing, or like... They do, that's, just, the, that's, that's the thing. They just give them more to do. Like, when I say the last four years, one organization that's qualified as a children, now children's have to be uh, certified by my office and by HUD, I don't have a marketplace right now for Chodos. And we had a workshop last year for Chodos in, in North, and, and HUD sponsored it. And we got like maybe, like maybe four or five organizations. And I do know there are some nonprofits right now in the development right now that are working towards getting that designation, but they're not here yet. So this kind of model kind of sort of pilots something. And who knows? We don't know who's going to apply, right, at, at this point. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Carmen one question. Um, is there funds available for this? So, um, there will be funds available. I mean, right now we just went through a preliminary review with the Affordable Housing Trust Committee. We've got about $5 million in the fund. Um, five million from the Affordable Housing Trust? Yeah, there's probably five million in the fund. We just went through preliminary reviews. Um, I think with everything set aside, we probably have it two or three left, but we're still working on the budget and the numbers. Um, and so again, it's, although it's up to, the, everything's based on reimbursement, right? So you have to show capacity. So we're, yeah, so it's not that we're going to allocate everything, but it's up to uh, a set aside and so on and so forth. So we may or may not, after the funding round, have um, all of it, but again, it's comparing applications, right? Once we see the same way with the process with the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we review applications, we review funding, and we'll see what's set aside. But I am aware of this proposal and this intent. What's your phone number? 201. Oh, Sam? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> no, not your personal phone number. I'm talking. <laughs> 
Sur le lèvres d'écran. All right. I don't think we have anything else. Do you guys have anything for? Okay. Let's take it from the top. He's planning here for specific items. Oh. Be here for a meeting after this. Yeah. Like yeah. It's good that you're here, though, because there may be some questions. Folks. All right, folks, if you're leaving, you leave quietly. Do it silently, please. Drink all that paper. 3A, City Ordinance 17098, an ordinance appropriating $4 million of proceeds of obligations not needed for their original purposes in order to provide for various capital improvements in and by the city of Jersey City and the county of Hudson. So what is the original purpose of this $4 million? So let me explain what this is. Yeah. Um, this is we're reappropriating this funding to finalize the MLK Annex construction. Uh, there have been an increase in costs at the site for three reasons. Uh, one, the, uh, the planning office made some design changes after the council approved the deal, which increased their costs. Uh, basically, they moved the, the entrance that was in the original plans in the center of the building within the parking lot of uh, the hub and asked them to relocate it to the MLK side of the building, they create a grander uh, opening, increase the cost, there's additional steel and various other costs involved. Uh, number two, um, the fit out costs for the offices, you know, we had a, a certain number in, in, the, in the deal and the, the, the cost of building out the office space is, is, is higher, um, especially for the clinics, which building out an office space is not, is a little bit cheaper than building out clinic space and the space for the WIC people. And number three, you know, the, the primary driving cost is the, you know, we encourage the, the developer to use the local trades. Um, so it, they paid a higher, higher wage to those employees, which increased the cost of the project. So we used, they, they worked with Pat Kelleher's group to hire local people and, you know, they paid a prevailing wage as opposed to what they planned on paying when they, you know, when they proposed the project initially. Uh, I will say that this developer, um, even though he doesn't have a PLA, has been working under the guise as if he did, and he's actually in compliance as if he had one. He has 20.6% minority and women participation in the project, and he actually has 20% local Jersey City residents working in the project. So. That's, that's where we're at, that's, that's why we're going. So of this 4 million, it's about 3.4, a little less than 3.4 million to, to finish the completion of the project. The, the balance of the funds are gonna be used for the purchase of the uh, equipment, the office uh, furniture and stuff that's gonna fit out the building. What I told you, when we talked about uh, Martin, the city of actually the developer gonna give the city of just like a $2 million to so fit out for credit. So I told you at the council meeting many times that nobody paid attention, it cost them more than $2 million will be. Now we talk about another $4 million actually. 3.4. Yeah, actually, about 3.4, by the end of the day, probably, probably end of October, the August, probably council, we got another one, so another couple I of million I won't be here dollars. for that one. So $4 million, so fill out total project cost is $6 million. But my concern is that, Planning office, we have to change the entrance, whatever they cost. How much cost will be? Do they not bring up the issue it's a, like a two years ago? Why they bring up the issue at the last minute? I found this out at the last minute, Councilman. I was pretty surprised myself. I actually had a conversation with the representative from my office who participated in those meetings and asked him why did this all happen after the fact, and he right. truly didn't have an answer for me. So, so you know, so, so they yeah. have many meetings they involved in. The construction meeting, not the ones, many times. Yeah. 
And the last thing they can hit the city of Georgia City, they ask for more dollars. You know? I think that's not fair to taxpayer. But what can we do? Yeah. Back to the councilman's original question, which is reappropriating from where? Oh, so the, uh, the majority of the funds uh, are coming from, since the Marion Gardens police project is a little bit stalled right now, we're pulling funds from that project to uh, complete this. And then if, that if, if we're going to proceed with that project, we committed to allocating that in the next bond ordinance. So was $4 million dollars come they from the police headquarters project? The Marion right? Gardens project yeah. to this project. This project? Yes, sir. With, with the later already, right? you have to rebid that anyway, so by the time that happens. But that was not year. the $4 million project, was it? We had $5 million allocated for that project. That's when the bids came in over $7 million that we, yeah. we kind of we pulled back on it. So, yes. Councilman Robinson? So, um, we're going to be reappropriating the funds, right? But as a city, we're, we're leasing the City Hall Annex it's for 25 option. years? Yes, at the, end of the, at the end of the lease, we own it. Okay, so how, where does this money, I guess, go? So if we, we, we're giving them $4 million, are they taking that off the lease price? No, 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 this is an addition. In, this is an addition to the construction cost. So the construction cost was X because of these, these changes that were made, these change yeah, orders the that were made. The paying the $4 million, correct? Correct. If, if we were building a project, we would have been paying it anyway. They're building it for us. But shouldn't we, they take that off of our lease option? See, or our lease? Robinson. They should increase our lease. Council, I mean, right. It's, it's like if we're going to be leasing it and we're paying, but, but giving then, them $4 million to help them build. If we bonded it, this money's already bonded, so we're paying that long term. So, Robinson, let me explain to you. As your businessman background, I have the same feeling like you have. But I'm going to make clear what happened when did we build the city hall annex building. We made a contract with the developer. They built actually roof, wall, window, and the basement, and then the basement to the floor. That's what was it. Now, after that, inside the building, we have to put in the uh, doors. We have to put in the air conditioning units, all those things. That's a separate. So city that the developer said they're going to give, give the city of Jersey $2 million credit for the put in the door, for the, the petitions, and the wires is also whatever more than two million dollars we have to pay. That's the four million the part of that we pay what we're supposed to pay. Okay, I missed that part. Yeah. It's, okay. It's yeah, additional you cost. I mean, there were changes, man. As I said, there were design changes after the deal was struck. Um, there were additional prevailing wages in order to encourage local trades to, to work on the project, which helped us to have Jersey residents work it. Helped us to have minority women business owners participate in the project. But those things, when we have uh, the, the talk about the project, they all calculated those items already. Well, you know, they are a. They would have hired their own subcontractors, not necessarily local people. Okay? Right. It's a too late to argue with them now. Uh, you want it one now? Okay, right? three of we, we did B through E, F. It's an ordinance to amend the chapter 84, alcoholic beverages, to create a special event exception to allow the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages on golf facilities as defined by the statute on Sundays during any golf tournament or special event directly related to playing golf from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. It's okay to do that. Most of us are not able to sell the liquor store, not able to sell. Yes. Yeah. I've raised this. Um, so, just for the record, because we're trying to introduce legislation to uh, increase, uh, have the, allow the, or the starting time to sell alcohol on Sundays for restaurants that have brunch, and was told that couldn't do it because um, I want to just relegate it to restaurants and not bars. I was told that it couldn't be done just for restaurants, that it had to be all or nothing based on the license and not, not the event. So I'm fine with this. I would just like to see us introduce legislation that would allow for 10 a.m. Um, sale of alcohol at restaurants and not bars. And keep in mind that Liberty National is making this request because they do host 
you know, worldwide golf events, specifically in September, we have the greatest golfers in the world participating in a, in a week-long golf event, um, the President's Cup, where it's the United States versus the world. And, um, you know, obviously Sunday being the, the, the final round, they start early. Sunday is a holy day. You're supposed not drink. It's 5 o'clock somewhere. <laughs> I know. Let's get on with the show. Okay. Okay. Right. okay. That's it. 3H. Uh, 3H is a five-year tax exemption pursuant to the provisions of the statute for property known by the street address of 65 Storms Avenue. Okay. Second reading. Any second reading questions? Yes. Uh, well, before we go there, oh, we, we have a public hearing on the 2017-2018 Exchange Place Alliance Special Improvement District Budget and Assessment Roll. BA and uh, the yes, Lower Department. I think I just want to make sure. <laughs> Those SI, they want to collect the SID tax, $3 million, and they want to spend the $700,000 approximately, and they want to try to create a surplus of $2.4 million. .3. Is that right? That's why I was questioning. So in other words, they collect the SID tax three times more than what they need. Yeah, I'm, I have the same question as you, Councilman. Yeah. I think it's a question we should bring in as city manager and ask them what the plan is. Maybe they have some capital improvements that they want to do in the, in the near future and need to build up the initial assessment. I think his question is whether it's legally permitted to do that. Right, because they're legally permitted, because most SID is <coughs> the state SID is a service, like a balanced budget, what their service is supposed to be. Not creative, saving money in the, I don't think so, but that's why it's just curious. Whatever they want to like to do, that's their role. But <coughs> people in the waterfront, they're also a Jersey taxpayer. As a councilman, we should be should <coughs> our concern why they collect three times more than their yearly budget. That's my question. All right? All right, just clear that. So they should show up to council meeting Wednesday to explain to us, okay? I don't know the SID. Yes. Yeah, we, it, What's it? We'll, we'll have a But I'll, I'll get a definitive answer for you. So it's probably okay. But as a councilman, when we see that, why do they have to be the other taxpayer too? Why? Oh, he's going to get you the fine. I'm going to get that. Yes. Taxpayer have to pay three times more than what they're supposed to be. I'll get you the All right. Okay. <laughs> any other questions related to any <laughs> second reading ordinances? Uh, just the one I received the us. Which one? We have, the, I, as you directed me, it's actually should be 11. It was the ordinance that was tabled after the close of the public hearing at the last meeting. These are the amendments to the Horsemans Cove Station redevelopment plan to alter the building regulating plan map and intensity summary table of the West Neighborhood District. Yeah, you I, asked me to bring this. I requested back. that at the request of planning, um, planning department, planning director. Um, suggested that um, the issue that was raised, I wasn't at the meeting, but the issue that was raised was a certain amount of community input um, hadn't been um, heard. But they've had that input since that meeting, and uh, my understanding is that um, while there may not be a complete agreement on that, that um, there certainly was community input. And Councilperson Osborne, while she's not here, she she affirmed for me that uh, at least for downtown, so that we're on table. On table, yeah. Okay. yeah. Right. It's the last item on the table the agenda. Okay. So now, so four I. Can I speak with a four I? This is a, like a fifteen years tax abatement. Itself. They build up like a, some kind of form house. Yes. But now my question is that I had a meeting with a developer because of this project actually over the fifteen years they only pay the city of Jersey like a fifty thousand dollars pile of fee. You know, so I bring up that argument to what they say is that we have a meeting. He said he willing to get the public developer willing to pay additional one more percent to go to school. Instead of the city, instead of city share our annual surcharge, 10 percent of subsidy instead of share the school, the developer may be interested in paying extra additional one percent 
for their gross revenue goes city at the school. But when I see that, did you hear that they're not counting with you? That 1% of the annual service charge or 1% of the 10%? Annual one percent. When we say in this order, we say that city of Georgia City share ten percent of our annual service charge with the school. So I bring up the issue that, that my concern is enough for the people of taxpayer. So the developer mentioned, not developer, developer represented the lawyer mentioned to that that developer maybe will need to pay additional one percent because they pay ten percent now, ten percent gross revenue. They're willing to pay one more percent, which will send to the school. So in other words, instead of 10%, increase 11% to grow their annual gross revenue. They mentioned to us and to me that they're willing to maybe change so and so. But what happened? I will, I will bring it to the attention of the deputy mayor, who yeah. does the negotiations, yeah. and, and see if they've had that, those discussions. Thank you very much. Additional one percent to send us. All right. Okay. So I was at the last meeting on this, and um, I did also meet with the developer and uh, have had conversations with the deputy mayor and uh, a couple of other uh, the ward F councilman as well on this uh, this matter. This is his ward, and so um, potentially discussing some other potential amendments on this. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Uh, resolutions. Okay, let's see. Today we're authorizing police at chapter 159, insertion of special items of revenues and appropriations. These are notices of grants that we've received since the adoption of the budget. B is authorizing the acceptance of cash donations from various sponsors to support the Hamilton Park Summer Youth Boys Basketball League for the Department of Recreation. C. Sorry, sir. Does it, does it say the amount of this? No, it just, it just, the money just keeps coming in, so it's just a blanket number. I mean, oh. We did a resolution once before, yeah. I think like seven or eight names on it. Since then, more people have become to, to help out the program. How much and everything, but I like um, this is a side question. It's a side thing happened this week. Um, did the uh, police deputy program was taking place in the various schools throughout this summer, and uh, it, it was discussed whatever that, that there was no funding whatever for like T-shirts and hats and things like that. Could you look into um, I guess for those programs that are trying to police department program? Yeah, yeah, police department running. They, they said they had a tough time getting. T-shirts. They have a large budget in the city. Right? Huh? They have a large budget in the city. Yeah. I feel like it's been a couple hundred dollars. There's some, some of the people out there um, getting donations from churches and stuff. When I saw it, like cadet program. Yeah, the cadet program. Yeah. So, what's it called? Cadet, cadet program. The, the deputy cadet. Cadets. Little cadet. cadet. Oh, okay. Yeah, you look into that. But they come out of their pockets. All right. Resolution C and D are related. Commending Maria Javier and Jamil Harper for acts of heroism and bravery. E, 45 year career of Marie Pagan is over. There was a celebration at the Municipal Court two weeks ago. F, resolution honoring Elder Willie Holmes Sr. for 53 years of pastoral service. G, Appointing Maureen Nally as alternative alternate member number one of the Jersey City Municipal Utilities Authority. 3H is done. I is a resolution authorizing the City of Jersey City to execute an indemnification agreement with PPG and authorizing the risk manager to issue a letter of insurance to PPG. J and K were discussed with the police earlier with Ms. Hansen and the police director. L, adopting L and M. Go back to what we alluded to earlier, the ratification of the 2017 
budget and assessment role of the Exchange Place Alliance Special Improvement District. Okay. Um, I, mean, just, I thought they were going to be here at this meeting, so we should definitely get the public hearing on this. Is this public hearing? Yes. Yep. Public hearing. What is the head of the, uh, this SID? What's the salary? This rule is going around. So I can't hear you. What is the salary of the person who was ever running this organization? I don't know. Uh, it's the, the, the budget says $300,000, but I imagine that's several staff members. But we have not been told, you know, the breakdown. Uh, I understand Elizabeth, uh, Kane. Elizabeth Kane, our former cultural affairs director, is in charge now. Okay. Uh, and we alluded to earlier, waiving the 20 days on Ordinance 17096. O P Q N R done with the traffic earlier. Uh, the business administrator will speak to this second amendment to the AR James and Company. Also, uh, limited doing business as AR James Media to construct and maintain bus shelters and improving a new site for the installation of a bus shelter. It just adding a bus shelter at Kennedy Boulevard, right uh, you know, north of Newark Avenue. T and U authorize the replacement of lost third party tax sale certificates. One to a LLC. Indecipherable, and the other is to Mr. Gregory Judge, number 2009 3265. V, W, and X, Y done earlier. Z, through Z3, all authorize the business administrator to execute discharges of mortgages at 66 and a half Belmont Avenue, 1 Saddlewood Court, 86A Virginia Avenue, 164 Virginia Avenue. I think there was one from the law department this morning. That's an arrow late, that's an arrow late stuff on okay. that. Z10 and Z11 we spoke about. C12 is a resolution authorizing and ratifying a consulting contract with Wagner Homes Inglis Incorporated to assist the City of Jersey City with the West District Police Precinct. Okay, well, go we're going to have a question about that one? Go back to that. that is just. Um, you know, we've hired a professional, or we're going to want to hire a professional to help us with our liquid damages, liquidated damages claim. You know, so they're going to help us identify all the uh, the issues that the contractor uh, should be responsible for. Yeah, you're familiar with all that, Chris? As your ward. So um, there were a lot of cost overruns in the construction. Right. So law department. Yeah, you know, we're going we're filing suit against them, so we're hiring this consultant to assist us in identifying. The cost of those overruns attributable to the contractor. When did that project start? Like 2004. Yeah, yeah I, I was just born. Okay. Z13 authorizing the award of contract to New Pathway Counseling Services to provide counseling services in connection with the Employees Assistance Program. Z14. Amendment to a contract with DLB Associates in connection with the Electrical Design and Construction Administration for this is the Law Department Library. Okay, so 14 and 15 are just extending the term of the contract, no additional cost. These projects are currently uh, you know, in limbo as they await state historic preservation approval because we are uh, historic, you know, older historic buildings. So there's no cost, it's just extending the contract to the professionals. We don't extra cost? No, no additional cost. No extra cost. These contracts were already awarded. We're just extending the term of the contract Extend because the, the project's not done as it waits for approval. Z15 is DBI. and Seminara for the reason Bob explained for engine com company number 15 renovations. Z16. No, Z15 has a problem. It's 15. I have, yeah, that I have a really concern. You know, I, I hope I'm wrong, 
But when I see that the total cost of the uh, professional service, $292,000. I'm pretty sure I'm correct. So now, January 20, 2009, we talked about that they uh, renovated this place, and the we contract with one of the, this company, $123,000 for the professional service, but because of their funding issue, we canceled it. So they deducted 46000 so what we pay, we pay $77,000. And the uh, June 15, 2016, we hired this company, we pay $73,000. And uh, uh, this year, we're gonna hire the company again, another $73,000. This is just extending the original contract. This is not- We're not gonna pay extra. No, no. This is just extending the term. Cause, cause the one year's ending, so we're extending it two more years. Two more years. No additional cost. No additional cost. The original amount is still in play. Yes, other than that, we never had much. Yeah, okay. All right, good. Z16, an amendment to a professional engineering service contract to Arcadis US, US Incorporated to conduct license system remediation for professional oversight in assisting with the vacating of tenants and removal of underground storage tanks on the PJP check caching site. We're asking them to help us write the bid specs for removal of the tanks. Alright, 17. Z17 was the uh, discharge of mortgage you were concerned about, Mr. Business Administrator, so at 59 much. Belmont Avenue. And Z18, we talked about with Dr. <coughs> Awuso. And the last is a resolution honoring Musab Ali. And that's what we got. Now, council members, just so I've got it straight, I have to find and locate this. Disable parking ordinance to get it on the agenda. We're going to take this ordinance off the tabled agenda. We need a resolution to change the August meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. Would someone make a motion to adjourn at 126? Second. Councilman Lavaro. Seconded by whom? Me. Rich. Magiano. Okay, Councilman Grzewski, Sapson, Gapson, Bajano, Ewan, Robinson, and Lavaro. We had five waited out to the end. Yep. Three and a half. Well, you're presenting. Oh, are you doing it at the meeting? Yeah, we do it at the meeting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I know, right? Well, Rick's closed the pool off in that.